Okay. Uh, morning, everybody. I hope you can see the, the slide. We, hopefully the audience is in there. Sorry? It says... 82 people are in the meeting. So that's a good turnout. So um, hopefully everyone's going to enjoy today. And um, special thank you to all the members who um, made the effort of creating a Padlet. Um, if you want to see those, you need to go on to the Diplis Forum website. Um, and they're in there um, under the news. So go navigate to the news menu. And you'll be able to see the the padlets that um, members have created. There's some really nice ones in there, um, and some really good ones from Scotland. Um, so yeah, they're worth definitely worth looking at. Um, so I've got a couple of slides. I think the main thing is uh, once the presentations start, uh, this is just for the panelists. We all need to make sure we're muted unless we're actually speaking. So if we can remember to do that, um, that's the, um, the microphone button at the top. So if we make sure we've only got one person with their microphone open whilst the talks are happening, that would be great. Uh, this is just for the panel. Uh, so for the questions, um, unfortunately, the, the webcast software that we're using um, does mean that the, the audience can't speak. So you have to type your question into the chat box. So that's at the bottom. Um, so if you click on the questions thing, it should drop down um, and you can type in your question into the box. And then remember to click the send button at the end um, and that will send off your question. And what happens is we get a, a great big list of all the questions and it's continuous for the whole webcast. So what would be really helpful would be if you could just um, put the name of the presenter that you want to ask a question to at the start of your question. Um, and then we can pick out the questions for the different speakers. Um, and then we've got a, a team of moderators um, who are going to ask your questions for you. So they'll read out your question to the speaker and then you'll hear the, the speaker respond to your question afterwards. So that's how the question and answers are going to work. So you need to find the questions menu in the little box on the top right, drop that down, type your question in, and then remember to send the press the send button at the end. Okay, so I think that's enough of my slides. Right, so what time is it? 23. Okay, right, we've got a few minutes. Um, I don't. Is Rob? Walton, yeah, because I thought he was. We might we might hear from Rob at the end of the session, because as you probably realised, he's going to be staying as the, the DF chairman. Um, so I think he's going to say a few words of, of bye bye at the end. So hopefully we will hear from Rob. Um, and I think we've had a we've checked. And everyone's running properly, so hopefully the session will go relatively smoothly. <laughs> Although <laughs> we can't promise that everyone's PowerPoint is going to behave. So there might be a few switching between people trying to run their own slides and then me running them for them if they have a, a PowerPoint problem. So um, there might be a little bit of um, switching around at the start of a few of the talks, but hopefully it should go fairly smoothly and uh, we shouldn't have too many glitches. Um, so anyone who hasn't looked at the, um, 
the padlets that um, the members have created. Please do take a look at those. Um, it's a kind of a, an attempt to replace the exhibitions that we would have if we were having a proper um, in-person meeting, which is a great shame that um, we didn't manage to do it this year. It was my intention, but the difficulty was um, finding someone who would rent us a room um, without putting, you know, the number of a capacity restriction on the room because of COVID. So um, I could have done it at the museum, but they'd cut the meeting room capacities by half. And so it became too difficult to, to organize a, an in-person meeting with the ongoing COVID restrictions. Um, so that's why we're doing another morning, Rob. Um, so that's why we're, we're still online this year, but um, it is my intention that this is the last online meeting. Um, and in the future, we'll try to have um, hybrid meetings where we record the session um, and broadcast it so that people can meet in person and, and do this as well. So that's the intention in the future. So hopefully this will be the last um, virtual only meeting, fingers crossed. Uh, okay, um, so Ines, if you're ready, are you yep. happy to, um, yeah, so I will find your presentation for you. Thank you. Um, okay, can you see, that? is that working? Yep, well I can see it. Yeah. So hopefully everyone else can. Okay. Brilliant. Shall I just get started, right. Zoe? Yes. I'm going to mute myself, uh, Ines, just to try and um, improve the sound. Okay. Um, brilliant. So, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to speak um, at this forum, which is very exciting. Uh, my name is Ines Januszczak. I am the sampling coordinator for the Darwin Tree of Life project based at the Natural History Museum. So my talk will be primarily talking about the progress when it comes to samples we've received or we've collected through the museum. However, I'll be doing a kind of a general overview as well. Um, okay, excellent. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so just in case uh, you didn't know, the Darwin Tree of Life project is a really ambitious scheme to try and sequence the genomes of every eukaryotic species in the UK. Um, so in total, this is around about 70,000 species. Um, and the, we are currently in the pilot scheme. So there's a two year pilot scheme to try and collect various family representatives of these species. The aim is once they're collected is to uh, sequence their whole genome. Um, and of course, we're not doing this on our own. Uh, there's numerous partners, so I've mentioned some of them here, which mainly include the Wellcome Sanger Institute, which is the institute doing the uh, whole genome sequencing, and as well as um, collectors based uh, through the University of Oxford, Kew Gardens, and the Marine Biological Association. So the Natural History Museum started their involvement in March 2020, which, um, if you remember, is the start of lockdown. So unfortunately, the first year of the project probably went off from a bit of a shaky start, uh, but things have picked up in the last few months. And I also just want to mention, I joined the project in June this year. So I won't be speaking so much about what happened last year, but I can give an update as to how um, kind of field work and collection have progressed in the last few months. Uh, just to recap, so the main difficulties with the project is that in order to preserve the whole genomes, Specimens have to be frozen and processed on dry ice, which is at minus 80 degrees, to maintain DNA quality. Um, as some people may know, uh, we have received samples in ethanol. Um, however, these won't be for whole genome, but for barcoding, DNA barcoding, which is when a short sequence of DNA is um, produced and is more used as an aid for identification, which I'll, I'll go into later. But I'm just making this distinction now, um, since I know people have sent in various types of samples before. Um, next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, so at the Natural History Museum, uh, we collect specimens in various different ways. Sorry, Erica, I stole these photos from your Twitter.
but um, these are from uh, the Diptrus Forum, which was, of course, a, a big um, event that occurred in June in Cornwall, where I think many people here would have gone and assisted in collection. Um, so we managed to collect almost 400 specimens. So not all Diptera, there was a various mix as well. Um, so those specimens um, would have been processed um, and on also for barcoding. Um, and within those, we managed to send a shipment um, at the bottom, which includes up to almost 500 tubes. Within those, 51 Diptera specimens from 23 families. Um, so we do fieldwork collection. Um, however, we also receive lots of live submissions and ethanol submissions from various collectors. Um, next slide, please, Zoe. Um, just thought I'd mention this here. Uh, we do receive lots of funny things at the museum. Uh, this one made me laugh because I received 10 tubes of carefully preserved flies, um, but with no name, no IDs, and no, no uh, collector information. Um, just a very gentle reminder to people if they want to send things to the museum, do include your name uh, so I know who to contact um, in order to give you the proper credit when we're doing the processing. Um, so we do accept specimens in ethanol, again, um, if live is not possible, because that is usually much more difficult for obvious reasons. And I found that um, diptera don't tend to do very well in the post, um, which is something I can also go into later if anyone has any questions as to how they can send live specimens to the museum itself. Uh, next slide. Um, so, like I mentioned, we're not the only group uh, working on arthropods. Um, Weiss and Woods, which is based through Oxford uh, University, um, they've also been collecting for a lot longer than we have, as they were fortunate enough to um, start their collection in late 2019. Um, and um, Liam Corley has given me some, um, a small update on um, their progress, which includes 275 species from 45 families, um, including these few notable ones. Uh, which I won't try and produce, uh, pronounce because <laughs> I'm not, I don't know how to say them. Um, but obviously, they've had lots and lots of progress when it comes to submissions to the Wellcome Sanger Institute, um, uh, mainly through White and Woods, but I believe they're also expanding their collection. Um, for future involvement, we are also talking to collaborators in the University of Edinburgh, um, as they have, as Sanger have produced, uh, have sent um, also uh, staff there um, to be based. Um, in more in Scotland in order to do more sampling in Scotland as well. So that's quite exciting. We'd have um, our collaborators are increasing and therefore there will be more collection going across the UK, not just based in uh, basically South England. Uh, next slide. So um, in terms of the Natural History Museum, um, as I mentioned, it's been very difficult uh, to sample in the first half of the um, pilot team. Um, so we do have some data. Um, currently in our records, we have seven or nearly 8,000 UK diptera species recorded. Of these, um, we have 111 families. Currently, in terms of the Natural History Museum update, we are desperately trying to um, make sure our databases are updated more regularly as we have been working with a bit of an out-of-date system where the families we have listed and the specimens we have collected have not matched. Um, so this is taken from the live list, which I believe was circulated earlier on in the project. This is currently being updated right now. And from next week, we'll have a much more accurate um, kind of description of what we have collected um, out of the sort of 850 family representatives that is the target. So at the Natural History Museum, we have 750 specimens of 317 species, which is quite good. Um, however, obviously, if we want to hit that 850 uh, target, uh, we do have a little bit more to go. It's worth noting the reason why we have so many more specimens compared to species is we do encourage uh, multiple collections so of each species. It's quite common that um, people will send us five or six specimens per species, which is the right thing to do because um, we have found that um, not all the specimens are ideal for whole genome sequencing. However, this is only found out quite later on in the, pro in the pro uh, process. So hence we do encourage multiple species collection even at this stage of the project. Uh, next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie.
Okay. So this database that we're updating, um, I'm planning to circulate in the future. Um, did the slide move? Oh, there we go. Excellent. Thank you, Zoe. Um, so the reason why we are doing all of this, and this is the end game. So I mentioned that we want to produce whole genomes from frozen specimens. Um, now, White and Woods, I know, are ahead of us when it comes to genome notes, um, but I can proudly say that NHM had our first genome note, which was, in fact, a fly. So a, the St. Mark's fly, BBMRC, which was collected by um, a member of uh, NHM staff. Um, so it is quite exciting that this is the end result. So the genome note is essentially a published document um, that states um, the various bases of that particular species. Um, so this is what they look like, um, and this is what we're aiming to have, uh, well, 850 versions of. Um, I will say that this fly was collected last year, so it has taken, you know, almost a year to get to this stage. So it will be some time before we get all the genome notes of the submissions. Um, but, you know, it's very, very exciting that we are making some progress there as well. So next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I thought I would uh, summarize by saying for more information on how you want to get involved or if you want um, to submit any specimens, do email the Darwin Tree of Life uh, email address. Um, this comes to me and our entire sampling team at the Natural History Museum. Um, and this includes if anyone needs any um, equipment, so things like tubes or tubes and ethanol, we're more than happy to provide those. Um, in terms of what has been collected and sequenced so far in the project, like I've mentioned, our Natural History Museum database has been a little bit out of date and we're, kind of cur we're cur currently trying to update this. However, if you want to see what has been sent to the Sanger Institute, um, this is available through the Darwin Tree of Life portal, which contains all of the information in terms of the samples that have been sent there and that the samples are in the freezers, as well as updates on how far they are in the whole genome pipeline. Um, as mentioned, once updated, I'm planning to circulate this live list. Um, as it's also, we're also planning to include specimen preparation data. So how many samples we have in ethanol, how many samples we have um, in the freezer in itself. Um, and once this is done, I think we'll have a much better um, representation of what uh, we have and what we need. Um, the species list collation has been a challenge um, and we are trying to work more with White and Woods and with other arthropod collectors to coordinate better what we are collecting. Um, since up till now, I think um, there's been a slight, um, uh, there's been, it's been a bit difficult to track uh, what people had in the pilot stage of the project. But moving forward, um, we're definitely planning to do more targeted sampling. Um, so if anyone would like to have that information once it's available, I'm more than happy to provide it to Zoe um, to circulate as well. But um, feel free to email me and the team for any questions that you have um, if you do want to get involved in the project. And of course, for everybody who has submitted um, something, uh, thank you very, very much for your support. And I look forward to continuing to work with you in the future as well. And I thought I'd include my favorite uh, fly species, which is of course the scorpion fly, um, as an uh, ending note. Thank you very much. I oh, can't hear you, Zoe. <laughs> so, well, uh, I discussed with Zoe about the possibility of doing a kind of a question oh. answer at the end. Um, not sure what that and try. So, sorry about that, Ines. That's all right. Yep, that's that's the intention. Yeah. So let me we can we've got a couple of questions. Um, so the first one from Darren Williams is asking where we're doing the sequencing. So they're sequencing at the well. So that's exactly the Could you say right. that again? 
so you that again yes you just broke up the whole genome sequencing the whole genome sequencing is being done at the welcome sanger institute um so that's where all our specimens will be sent after they've been processed um, so we don't do any of the whole genome sequencing at the Natural History Museum. However, we do do the initial stage of the analysis, which is the DNA barcoding, um, where a much shorter sequence is produced. Okay, so it's so we're doing a small amount at the museum, but the majority is being done at the Sanger. Okay, and there's a question here from Gabriel Nevi. It says, what is the final aim of the tree of life, a complete phylogeny, and are there any unexpected results to date? That's a really, that's a really good question. Um, so I mentioned the whole genome. Obviously, getting the genome note is ultimately the short-term goal. However, the ultimate goal would be um, if we are able to monitor the biodiversity of all of the species in the UK, that would be a huge advantage and an incredible record to have, especially since measuring biodiversity is something that is currently being prioritized as a measure of, me as a measure of um, the health of the environment. Um, so I think long term, if we have the genome of all of the species, this has huge um, implications for how we monitor biodiversity, and how we do future biological sampling, especially as there is so much um, progress in things like eDNA, um, using smaller bits of tissue um, to see if we can um, identify species. So I think um, there's the identity, the identifying species aspect of it. There is the monitoring species aspect of it. And like you mentioned, um, there have been some unexpected results in the sense of um, species which were Unfortunately, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but there have been um, cases where species that were identified as one. Oh, no, I do remember in analysts. So there's an insignia um, ardeni, there's a type of worm. So there's a striped and non striped, which people have thought were two different species. However, um, they've never been sequenced before. So this was a morphological assumption as opposed to a genetic one. And I think the more um, genomes we sequence, um, we will start to get more and more examples of perhaps species which were put in the same family or in the same genus that may turn out to not that not to be the case, but simply because no one had actually studied their genome before. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Okay, so we've got some more questions coming in. Um, one from Mike Ashworth. Uh, how many of the barcoding specimens um, have been done? And will they end up in bold? That's a very good question. Thank you, Mike, for your question. And Mike, Mike submitted many things to the project, so thank you for that as well. Um, so I can't, off the top of my head, tell you how many we have barcoded. But what I can tell you is each specimen has about a 70% success rate. So by that, I mean passing barcoding, then having a merged sequence, and then having a match on bold. So it's a three-stage process. Um, once the DNA barcoding, if it is successful, then it will go on bold, yes. Um, however, the sequence has to be of a high enough quality um, to be accepted by bold. And that is something that is very variable and depends on the species or depends on the preservation. But yes, anything that is submitted from DNA barcoding, the aim is that it will be put on the bold, um, which is an online database, for those who don't know, of um, genetic sequences. Uh, which means people all around the world um, could use it uh, to identify species as well. Okay, so am I right in thinking that BOLD have, have set up a whole bunch of criteria now that um, to try and make sure to curate what gets onto the database to, to stop any, any sequences that aren't particularly good ending up in the database, is that right? So there's now quite a lot of... So I'll say that's half right, Zoe. So BOLD do have a criteria. However, that criteria isn't particularly strict. So the ah. Natural History Museum, um, we will only submit sequences to BOLD that, have been, that are merged, which means that when the DNA is um, being amplified um, and then put through, um, then when the DNA is being amplified, it has to have, be a certain um, state 
in order for us to deem it acceptable to go on fold. And this is generally the case. However, what we can't control is if people put misidentified species on fold, because you have situations where the sequence is good, however, the, identi the identity isn't. But that is incredibly difficult to monitor uh, because bold will accept it if the sequence is good. There are cases when you will have a very, very strong identification and a strong sequence, but it will match to an assortment of species. And this is mainly, this will require manual cleanup. So we are currently talking about whether we should be telling bold if there are clear errors in their database. Um, but this is not something that bold can do automatically. It would require people looking at the database and pointing out these errors. Okay, that's interesting. All right, we've got a couple of another question from Darren Williams. Um, if we have this information, so I think he's referring to the, the genomes and the, the sequence. Um, we, if we have this information, we understand basic biology, i.e., physiology and development. Um, I think that's going to that would require us knowing what all the genes in the genome are doing, isn't it? Sorry, what, what's the question? Sorry. He's, he's, uh, it says, if we have this information, we understand, aha, here we go, a statement, not a question. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Right. How do I answer? <laughs> um, uh, how do I, I answer that? Yeah. I think we can compile these genomes, but we don't necessarily know what all of the genes in the genome are doing, do we? What does he mean by rules of the genome, I suppose? Uh, uh, well, no, it's just, it, it, it is just a statement. He said, uh, if we have this information, we understand basic biology, i.e. physiology slash development. Um, but I'm not sure that we do, do we? Because we don't know what all of the genes are doing, do we? So again, the end goal is, yes, if you sequence everything, you will have a much better understanding of how species relate and how their genomes relate, but we're nowhere near there yet. And I think, like you mentioned earlier, lots and lots of things will probably come up the more sequences we, we generate. And what's also true is currently there's limitations. There's limitations in size, there's limitations in preservation, um, but the aim is, once we have done the collecting, hopefully the technology will improve enough that we can sequence, for example, incredibly small specimens, or we can sequence um, specimens that have not been preserved um, in minor safety. Um, but that will be, that's a few years away. Um, so yes, there's definitely a lot more work to be done. Okay, we've got a, a comment from Liam Crowley here. He says, Hi Liam. <laughs> Darren is referring to the difference between annotated genomes and unannotated genomes. Um, oh, <laughs> and uh, a question, long question from uh, John and Barbara Ismay. Uh, do we check identifications with experts before you submit? Um, we have been wrongly identified. We have seen wrongly identified uh, chlorophids in pretty much all museum collections. Also, we know that two different species, non-British, share the same barcode. We think this is because chlorophids have evolved recently and rapidly. Um, oh, and it said, okay, so this is from Barbara, uh, not from John Ismay, but from Barbara Ismay. Um, so are there cases where barcodes don't work for species identification, do you know? So again, um, our policy is if the sequence is good, we will submit it to BOLD. The ID that we use then depends on who submitted it and whether there are any matches. If there are no matches on BOLD because there have been no sequences submitted before, we will use the, identi the um, ID given by the expert identifier. And for us, expert identifiers mean trusted members of the community, uh, trusted uh, well, curators at the museum, people deemed experts in their field. So we will not put an ID through that has not been validated um, by various people. Um, so if things have been misidentified in the past in bold, this is exactly the kind of thing which we want to combat. 
Um, hence, again, it's important we have multiple specimens, um, all verified by someone who is an expert in that field, so we can improve the bold database. So the end result, will it be that people looking at the data that is generated by DTOL will be able to see the person who made the identification? So that will happen? Yes. Well, not only that that, that will happen, that is happening. So um, there's been cases where we have had ex expert identifiers identify something and it has matched to something different on bold. Um, however, they then checked who did the um, the bold submission and found it to be another person in the field who um, for you know works in a different institution, for example. Um, and in those cases, it's very much you know there needs to be a conversation, um, in, and they need there is an element of trust there as well. So yes, anyone who submits something to bold, um, the ID, their name will be attached to the record, so people will be able to see who submitted it. Okay, we've got, I think this, we're going to have to make this the last one because it is 11 o'clock. We've got a clarification from uh, Liam Crowley, uh, and he says, barcodes are also assessed in a phylogenetic framework, i.e. draw a gene tree to ensure the ID is accurate. So I would say to Liam, this is true when you have enough genomes. However, there's been cases where we put a tree together and there hasn't been enough sequences on bold to fill out the tree. So I think the tree is good if you have enough of the data, but this isn't always the case, as mentioned earlier as well. So I think it's, um, it's a good tool to have, but I wouldn't use it as the only tool. Okay, right. Thank you very much, Ines. That's great. Um, and we do need to move on now because we're, it's one minute past 11 and it's time for Roger Norris. So Great. thank you very much. Thank you very much and goodbye, Ness. Bye. Thank you. Right. Morning, Roger. Good morning, Zoe. Now, now I am need I... to Right, okay. Are you changing I'm me? Going to make the presenter. The presenter, Roger. Right. Um... Okay. Right. Okay. Let's see if I can find what I was going to talk about. There we are. Right, okay. Can we all see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Right, okay. Well, let's fire away then. Okay, this uh, this talk really is one that um, anyone that went on the Diptris Forum field meeting this summer will have already heard, so you can go off and have your cup of tea early. For the rest of you, then, um, I'm going to try to give you an idea as to why uh, we've seen what appear to be very substantial declines in many insect groups and especially in some diptera. Um, the presentation technically is me but because Stuart has put in quite a lot of work on some aspects of the analysis it's me and Stuart and you'll see the same thing with the paper that we've just put in British Wildlife. So let's move on. Um, I'm going to use hoverflies as an analogue because that's the data set we play with. Um, it's not to say that it's the only uh, data set that could be used uh, to highlight some of the issues, but one of the nice things about hoverflies is that they uh, utilize a very wide range of habitats, and as such, they may actually provide more pointers than uh, some groups of insects. As you can see from this particular slide, um, we're looking at uh, declines in hoverflies. These have been uh, predicted or established using uh, the um, the package Frescalo, which um, which was written by Mark Hill and published in around about 2012. Stuart actually wrote an R package for it, so if anyone wants to play with Frescalo, they can do so. Um, that's R Frescalo. The story is quite an interesting one. I mean, in this particular one, uh, we're showing changes between 1980 and 2012. And as you can see, we see a decline of something in the order of 41%. Now, that's a bit variable because it depends on how you interpret the data set. I won't go into that at this stage, but there are some complications. Um, since that particular presentation was put together, Stuart's done an another an analysis, and we now come out at something like 55% decline. Uh, so it's pretty serious. And 
the, the, the steepness of the decline can be uh, uh, picked up from the uh, uh, from the graph on the right hand side, which not only produces uh, the, the the rate of decline, but a, a 95% confidence limit. So, I mean, what we are saying there is that there are quite broad spread of confidence in what the decline is, but there's absolutely no doubt there is a sharp and very considerable decline. Um, but those declines are not uniform. And, and I think this is probably one of the things that doesn't come out very well in analyses that we see uh, published. Uh, you see national declines, you see predictions of declines and so on. Uh, but if you start to break it down into regions, you see that there's a very substantial difference between most of the British Isles and the Southeast. And um, that gives me some reasons to suspect that there may be something rather unusual going on. Um, there are several possibilities. Uh, the normal view or the, the received wisdom is that uh, the main reasons for insect decline are agricultural intensification and pesticide use. Now, there have been papers in which it has been argued that the correlation is pretty good for agricultural intensification and pesticide use, and that the correlation between climate change and insect um, uh, status is one uh, of benefit where insects are actually expanding their range rather than contracting their range. So when we start adding climate change into the mix, we must recognize that there are uh, conflicting messages coming out of uh, the data. Um, agricultural intensification and pesticides, there's, a, there's quite a nice paper by Mancia, Mancin, Mancinia and uh, et al, uh, published in 2020. Um, when I looked at the map of that, it struck me that there were some considerable similarities in it to um, other environmental factors. So although it might be that uh, they picked up a, a strong correlation with um, pesticide usage, I don't think that's the whole story. Um, there is an alternative theory, and um, uh, Professor John Wines uh, in America came up with uh, a series of ideas, uh, two papers that have been published that I think are pretty com com compelling. Um, they, they resonate very well with some of the observations that I've seen in the field. And I do stress here that a lot of what we're talking about is um, trying to match up responses to field experience and not simply to running a model or looking at a data set. It's understanding how the animals actually behave in the field. So I think there are a number of other factors that we might take into account. Um, I'm not the only one, Stuart thinks the same, uh, and there will be other people as well. Um, so the first thing that a lot of people talk about is unusually cold spells. And a lot of people say, well, what about the beast from the east? Well, the beast from the east was not even a beast. It was a, a mere whimper from the east, if you compare it to uh, the winter of 1963, which I can remember because my, my family home froze up so much that we had no heating for six weeks. Um, that's one end of the scale, winter freezes. The other one that's probably more interesting is um, uh, cold snaps, and we saw that this, this, this spring. Now, I won't go into that in too much detail, but I think there may actually be a developing picture of a new uh, climate in which you get these cold snaps. Heat waves, well, everyone that's over about 50 can certainly remember the 1976 heat wave. Um, and it was pretty profound, but there have been a lot more, and some of the recent ones have been almost as um, as profound. The, the one difference that we do have between the 76 drought and more recent ones is that 1976 or 76 heat wave was that more recent ones were not preceded by a drought. Uh, and in that respect, 1976 remains a little bit unusual because there were the better part of 18 months of drought with a, a heat wave at, towards the end of it. Nevertheless, um, we had drought in 1976. We have had a number of quite profound droughts since then. Um, I lived in Yorkshire um, in 
the mid 1990s and i remember the uh, the procession of water tankers uh, between the west of england or the northwest of england and yorkshire trying to keep us with enough water to shower and bathe in whereas actually all we needed was drinking water um and then floods well floods do some quite interesting things as well uh the most profound one recently i suppose was that that of 2013-14 uh, but we've also seen some pretty extreme weather this year so a whole sequence of extreme weather all of which could impact on invertebrates um, the one that I'm really interested in is, is heat waves. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, and this, this map, it's one of many that have been, been produced, but it gives you a, uh, an idea of heat wave pressure across England. Now, it's just worth bearing in mind that although there are differences between this map and the pesticide map, there are also some quite strong parallels. And I reckon that's, uh, that's telling us something, something quite important. Um, now, trying to understand extreme weather is extremely difficult. There are no easy metrics. Um, that's, that can be presented in all sorts of ways, but for this purpose, um, Stuart uh, plotted the number of days of temperature over 27 degrees uh, between 1880 or the 1870, actually, uh, and 2020. Um, and I think the, the story is pretty compelling. It bounces around an awful lot, but as you can see, the numbers of hot days are rising and do seem to have been rising particularly quickly post-1960. Now that really starts to correlate to some extent with uh, what we see in insect decline, which uh, has been a period of decline from, from the 1980s and an increasingly steep decline from around about the mid 2000s perhaps a little bit beyond that so we can come up with a bit of a conceptual model and i remember from work people said um, oh we don't want any models well all models are based on conceptual models um, and i'm a great believer in conceptual conceptualizing um, circumstances so that you can build an idea of what's going on so my conceptual model um, is based on a number of factors. Um, the first one is that extreme events lead to localized extinctions. Now, uh, John Wines has, has brought that up. Uh, it's certainly not mine, um, but nevertheless, it is something that we need to think about. And we need to think about how those extinctions happen. Shortening of adult lives, reduction in fecundity, or the death of juvenile stages. Now, all of those can have some effect and reduce populations. Um, extreme cold winters have been shown to knock out populations on the edge of range. So um, we can certainly say that edge of range species are vulnerable in cold circumstances. And we saw this with Volicella zonaria in the 1960s. But those species conversely are the ones that are likely to respond very positively uh, to warmer temperatures and as we've seen in the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, species such as Volicillus and area have gone stupid and gone right the way through the country. They're now up in Scotland. Um, Stuart predicted they'd be in Scotland in 19, uh, sorry, in 2004. He was only two years right out. It, it got to Glasgow in 2018. Uh, he thought 2020. So that was pretty good. Um, extreme flooding again leads to localized drownings of fauna. So again, we see localized ex extirpations. Um, now, the important thing there is that if you start sampling seasonally flooded woodlands, they're often miserable. There, you, you go in, you sweep like mad. You end up with large numbers of um, uh, coronamids and 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 um, fairly fast breeding species you don't see a great deal of interesting species so we can we can say that all three of those factors um, may have an impact um, heat waves well there's developing evidence of sharp declines in detected insect activity now the problem we've got is that when you look at these declines uh, we can't say with absolute certainty that the decline is no insects. It may be that the insects are there and they haven't been detected, or it may be that 
those of us that go out to detect them don't like going out in that weather and therefore don't detect them. Um, I'm still persuaded that actually they're not there. Um, and one of the reasons that one might be convinced by that is that when we have these very hot periods, we see a spike in human deaths as well. Um, and then there's the most obvious thing on the ground. If you have a drought, water bodies dry up. Um, and particularly habitats that are based on clay. I mean, clay can turn into something like concrete. Now, if you're a, a ground-dwelling insect or an insect, insect larva in such ground, you're not going to do very well. And if the spring that you live in or the seepage line that you live in uh, disappears, your chances are pretty small. So these normally wet places are going to be pretty rapidly affected by drought. And so we must expect that populations are being eliminated. And the big question is, can they recover? Um, now, if suitable conditions reoccur, then maybe re recolonization is possible. Um, but a lot of these, the things that we're looking at are highly specialized. The habitats that they live in are generally quite small. You know, we're not talking about acres and acres and acres. We may well be talking about a few dozens of meters. And fragmentation of habitat obviously makes this increasingly difficult. So in that respect, a combination of uh, local extinction together with uh, a wider loss of habitat would combine. So that would support some of the arguments that it's habitat loss that's the problem. However, these species are highly specialist and in the wider countryside probably don't occur um, as widely as people think they might. There is some evidence of declines that may be reversed by um, changing conditions. Certainly that's evident from upland crane fly populations where uh, re-wetting of um, uh, blanket bogs uh, and, and the edges of, of, of the uplands has been shown to quite rapidly uh, reverse losses, but that's dependent hugely upon there being a, a residue of, uh, of, of the species uh, concerned. Um, and with that, we also see improvements in bird breeding success. So that will come back in a minute. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, the, the real issue is if these events happen, is there enough time for a recovery in the population? Um, and obviously, the more frequent the event, the less chance there is of recovery. And we're looking at something akin to death by a thousand cuts. Um, Stuart and I have um titled that death by a hundred droughts but there are a number of other factors too so um where are we moving well one of the reasons to be interested in flies is that a lot of flies are strongly wetland associate or they are particularly associated with high humidity so they're going to be very very vulnerable to uh, loss to heat waves and drought um, what we don't have at the moment is a full understanding of the um, thermal and humidity gradients that individual species are associated with. And I think that's going to be quite an interesting area for future research. Um, dry habitats, uh, dry habitat species, highly at risk from flooding. And certainly if you look at places like um, the Somerset levels, um, those species that were just above the, the wet margins would have been particularly vulnerable. And then uh, montane species, well, they have a, a double, uh, double whammy. Firstly, they've got a risk of heat and drought when we do have droughts. Um, and then we also have the problem of shorter winters and indeed not just shorter winters, less snowfall, therefore, less water in the spring, therefore uh, more risk of drought within uh, upland wetland systems that are pretty reliant on a continual supply of water. They're usually on quite hard rocks. There's not much of a, res uh, a, a residual water table. So we've got a combination of factors there of weather, but also 
of the geography and in particularly the lithology of the area. And if there's insect decline, well, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? If there aren't any insects about, what are the birds going to eat? Um, now, a lot of birds may feed on um, seeds, for example, but they'll feed their, their young on insects. So an awful lot of seed eaters that we consider to be farmland birds may actually be suffering not from a loss of seed, but actually a loss of insects in the spring to feed their young. And then the other side of it, species like hirundines and so on, that are highly associated with aerial plankton and perhaps aerial plankton that are driven by things like chironomids, if wet, wet habitats dry up, there isn't any insect biomass. Therefore, there's less food. Therefore, they have uh, less success in breeding. And when you bear in mind, things like swallows may have two or three broods in a season. If there's no food, you're not getting the two or three broods. And therefore, the numbers of, of new animals recruited to the population must decline and decline quite quickly. So I'll give you that as food for thought. Um, I'm doing a bit of work with BTO at the moment to try and uh, uh, take this a little bit further forward. Um, and I hope with any luck, it might stimulate uh, a lot more thinking and perhaps a little bit more research. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Roger. That was very interesting. Um, right. We have a question in the chat from Mike Ashworth. Uh, and he says, Roger, could increased temperatures cause an increase in the populations of pest species, causing an increase in pesticide use and therefore declines in all species? Possibly. Uh, there is some, some evidence of um, aphid populations uh, rising, and it is possible that you'd end up with more pesticide use. But the one issue that I would take there is one still trying to put the blame on pesticides when the vast amount of damage done to the countryside by both the pesticide world and the um, uh, development world has already happened. If you look at uh, the way the countryside has changed over the last hundred years, my mother described pre and just post-war the Derbyshire Dales being absolutely a sea of, uh, of orchids. Uh, going back there now, you've got a few tiny fragments. The same thing holds with if you go to Lincolnshire, you can put as much pesticide on the fields of Lincolnshire as you like. But the biggest issue there is there aren't any insects anyway. They've already gone. If you're lucky, there's a few in the drains, but there isn't much around. It's one of the least biodiverse areas in the country. So I think when you start looking at what we're talking about of declines, declines in a broad spectrum of specialist species, you're not getting those specialist species in that agricultural area. The specialist species are, for example, uh, those that may be in, for example, the uh, the southern uh, woodland belt, uh, southern forest belt. And Stuart and I are picking up innumerable declines or disappearances of species that you just would not associate with um, the impact of pesticides. Even on my local site, I'm seeing things disappear. Now that site's buffered from pesticides by about 10 miles of, um, uh, of urbanization. Not any more urbanized, it's per perfectly buffered, but they're going or disappeared. Hmm. Okay, a couple more questions for you, Roger. Uh, this is from, uh, John and Barbara Ismay, do you think the building pressure in the southeast also have an impact? Sorry, do I think the... Well, the, the just the sheer amount of building that go, you know, the huge conurbation that is the southeast of England. No, I don't. I think that that, that, that is a small impact and it goes back to my last answer. Um, the species that we're seeing declining <clears throat> are species that um, are very often associated with uh, habitats that haven't been built on. Um, 
for example, I'll use my local site. It's um, the better part of um, 300 hectares of um, uh, open ground, a mixture of secondary woodland and grassland and a few wetlands. Um, in the 1980s, I used to see Leucozona leucorum quite frequently. I haven't got proper data. This is a classic example of you really ought to record absolutely everything all the time because when you go back, you need those data and they're not there. However, Leucozona leucorum was perfectly present uh, in the 1980s. I last saw it on that site in 2002. Over the last four years, I've been recording that site on a daily basis and haven't seen it. So it was a common species, it's disappeared. I don't believe for the life of me that that would have gone because someone's built on a, a, a local playing field. Um, yeah. It, it just doesn't work. Um, and mm -hmm. there are many, many more, as I say, in the forest belt of Southern England that used to be there. They're dead obvious species. They're ones that today's recorders record very easily. Something like Leucozona glaucia, dead easy to photograph, obvious thing. Um, and lots and lots of people recording in the south of England. It's virtually disappeared from the forest belt. You can't put that down to development. Yeah, good point. Okay, some more questions. Um, from Gabriel Levy, uh, are there any data on which life stage, uh, brackets, egg, larvae, pupa, imago, are the most sensitive to heat waves? Uh, this is an area where we need a lot more work. Um, there will be some data, um, but that it's by analogy rather than by uh, detailed research. The most obvious one is the one I quoted, which is um, crane fly um, populations in uh, upland wetlands. Um, by re-wetting those wetlands, uh, crane fly numbers have increased. Therefore, by, um, by uh, um, extrapolation, we must assume that uh, in dry conditions, crane fly larvae suffer pretty badly. That's, that's a no-brainer. They're wetland crane flies. If it gets dry, they're not there. Um, if it gets wet again, small pockets of population do recover and recover quite quickly. Um, the thing that we need to bear in mind is that a lot of these animals um, breed in vast numbers and so um, it may only take two or three years to see a full recovery and what we really see is a, a very rapid recovery by species that are multi-brooded so for example we're not seeing declines in things like heavy surface multiators what we do see is year-to-year -year fluctuations in in their abundance but we don't see the declines that you would see, for example, with something like Leucozona glaucia, um, which to all intents and purposes has disappeared from Southeast England. And there are four or five other species that I think either are at that stage or very close to it. Hmm. Okay, another question, this time from Rob Davis. Uh, insects as a food source for people, uh, with there being an increasing interest in this, can commercial interests help by biodiversity? Uh, exploratory question on thoughts on um, micro livestock. <laughs> Hope this is not a silly question. Of course not, Rob. <laughs> um, um, well, let's let's separate out what we're talking about. Um, commercial production of um, insect biomass um, is very much associated with um species that are quite generalist and fairly easy to provide the environmental circumstances they need to breed up um, that may well mean that you could breed up large numbers of chironomids and release them it would be a very labor intensive process but it might help a localized hirundine population um, i don't think it'll reduce it'll increase biodiversity i think it will just simply be a distraction um, my instincts are that uh, all of that sort of effort is going to be very expensive and um, will take our minds away from resolving the bigger issue, which for my mind is 
we need to think much more about how water particularly um, is conserved. Um, we need groundwater plans. We need to understand where uh, the greatest risks are to biodiversity. And that's not just your traditional wetlands, it's, it's seepage zones. People just do not think of it. Um, and I think we need to see a very different attitude in, for example, um, we, see, we see what call themselves landscape ecologists, and they spend a lot of time mapping things that quite frankly um, are irrelevant. You know, oh yeah, we'll have a woodland here and a hedgerow here and the bats will fly down that. Well, where's the seepage line for specialist insects? <laughs> you know, all those sorts of things. So yes, you might have a few more bats and you might have a few more badgers, but you're not going to have, you're not going to address the bigger biodiversity issue until you actually make sure that there isn't any pumping that's removing the water that maintains that seepage line for life or that maintains the winterbornes, for example, on, on chalk. So those are the sorts of issues that we've got to put our mind to. Mm, yes, I think any um, ecosystem that you want to conserve, you've got to think about the insects because they're, you know, they're, they're the producers, they're at the bottom yeah. of the, the food chain. So That's right. Okay, more from the chat. Brian Nelson, uh, some very interesting thoughts by Roger. I think the impact of climate change is a final stage of what has been a loss of habitats. Um, that is what drives fragmentation and therefore the loss of species. In Europe, there are spe uh, sorry. In Europe, are these species uh, declining? Um, after all, the GB climate is not extreme compared to France, Spain, other hotter summers and colder winters. So. Do you know what's happening to some of these mob of flies that you've talked about on the continent, where they're, well, they're going to be having more extreme weather? Well, uh, obviously, there's there's quite a long way to go before we have a, a view across Europe. I mean, what Stuart and I are talking about is, is fairly new. Um, however, I have had quite a lot of com communication with um, friends in Holland and Belgium, and the arguments that I've put forward about the Leucozona species have been borne out. The, the, the Dutch particularly say, yes, they've gone from Holland. Um, and what they've also warned is that um, species that we still get in Southeast England are disappearing more rapidly in Holland. So I, I, think, um, I think we must start from the principle that um, we've po po possibly been buffered the biggest issue is we don't have data. Um, the UK is very lucky because we have some of the most active recording schemes and they've been active for 40 plus years. Um, most of Europe doesn't have those. It has uh, data sets that may well be developed by a small number of specialists, but it doesn't have the depth of data that the UK has. So trying to marry what's going on with Europe with, with what's going on here is extremely difficult. Um, that is part of the research issue that we need to think about. But again, I come back to the point that although fragmentation of habitat is something that has been responsible for declines in the past decades, what we're now looking at is a fundamental change in the hydrology and um, humidity gradients of um, remaining habitat. So it doesn't really matter now what what else is going on. It's the fact that we've already got this problem for those sites and they are now so much more isolated that recovery is just not possible. Interesting. Okay, Roger, on the um, timetable, um, yeah. the the coffee break <laughs> was, <laughs> was scheduled to start at 25 past 11. So we've, we've rolled past that. Um, oh dear. Bill, Bill sure it's due to start until five to 12. So I think if people um, need a break, um, you're welcome to do so. Roger, are you happy to answer some more questions? Are you willing to carry on? Yeah, I mean, I'm quite happy to, you know, people can throw things at me. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm here to talk. Okay, well, there's a few more in the chat. So 
I'm going to carry on um, going through the questions. Um, and I suggest that um, anyone who'd like to take a break, um, now is your opportunity uh, and return at five to 12 for um, Will Hawke's talk on insect migration. So with that, back to the questions. Okay, next question, Roger. Now, where was I? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to work out now how to, I think I'll turn off show screen. There we are. Gets rid of okay. some of the, right, that's better. So, so I can talk Duke to you. James is asking about um, what about urban pesti pesticide use? Uh, how much impact does this have? Um, so what if, you know, people using stuff in their gardens? I think that might be something that's changing, has changed in recent decades. I think people used to be much more willing to use a lot of pesticides in their gardens and they're now you know, people like the RHS are trying to persuade people not to do that to the same extent. So that might be quite a difficult thing to unpick. What do you think, Roger? Um, I think you have to look at everything in proportion. Um, yes, some people will use pesticides. And yes, there is a lobby that's very anti-pesticide. Now, I'm not necessarily pro-pesticide. I'm not. Uh, I think we can minimize that. But I think it's very easy to throw bricks at uh, a, a traditional um, problem. I would be more inclined in the urban environment to blame everyone that worships their car, turns their front garden into a car park, and turns their back garden into decking. I think that's far, far more likely to be causing problems. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, I get out the Kango, I dig up all those front gardens, and I turn them into nice thistle patches. Okay, you heard it here. Those are your instructions for next weekend, I think, yeah? Yeah, I'll uh, probably okay. get slaughtered for that. <laughs> okay, uh, from Rob Davis. Um, would there be, uh, or would there only be interest in some particular species? I wonder if there's an opportunity for philanthropy by commercial enterprise to help market their product in this area. We help uh, diversity by insect welfare while providing meat alternatives. Okay, so this is this is a follow-on from um, Rob's <laughs> earlier comment about um, commercial growing of insects for food. Um, I think what what you said earlier about the 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 kind the species that get grown commercially um, in these um, factories, I guess. They tend to be generous, don't they? Um, things that are easy to culture don't have very stringent requirements for their growth environment or their food and nutrition. And so they're things that cope better with stressed environments anyway, aren't they? So they're not necessarily the species that we're going to lose as, as these changes happen. Would you agree with that, Roger? I think there's a common common thread to this. Um, it's much the same as people saying, well, we really must re uh, return sea eagles to North Norfolk or to the Isle of Wight. Um, that gives everyone the idea that you can solve your bio biodiversity problem by the influx of a few little things. Um, we've got a tweak. Now we've got sea eagles. Everything's all right. Now we've got 200 extra um, uh, episurface boltiatus released in every garden. Everything's all right. Frankly, that's not. Um, if you're going to cherry pick the species that you that you preserve out of Britain's diptera, well, we've got 7,100 species. Um, if you choose 10 species that you can breed up, uh, you're losing um, 7,090 uh, species, potentially. You won't lose that many, but you know, seeing a decline of something like 50% over uh, 40 years, now that's 50% decline in the T factor, it's not 50% decline in biomass. Um, the Germans have found 75% decline. Um, we're just not going to deal with this by some sort of commercial, let's breed up some insects. We've got to change the way that we manage the landscape, and we've got to change people's perceptions of what um, they can have in terms of facilities. For example, whilst it might not be very nice, I think we've got to start saying to people, you only need to take a shower once a week or twice a week, not three times a day because you feel sweaty. 
you know i mean we, we might keep social distancing will work a lot better that way okay so final comments from from rob i think he's he's saying um these uh, micro livestock uh, places um it would be part of their deal that they would have to allocate part of their facility to sensitive endangered species uh, and they would have to do some philanthropy on the side um, if they were a going concern. So mm, I'm, I'm, be... I, I think there may be a case for some of that, but I think you've got to then look at, um, it comes back to what I said earlier about lithology. Um, mm. If you look at the landscape of Britain, um, there are certain places and certain parts of the, our geography that are extremely biodiverse. Um, on balance, they tend to be places that are um, uh, on the calcareous side. And um, so you're looking mainly at limestones or lime rich or, or um, basic rich uh, soils. They tend to be um, deeper soils. So the, when you start looking at biodiversity across Britain, it is naturally less biodiverse uh, on harder rocks, and it is particularly non-biodiverse when you get onto the coal measures. So, for example, if you go to Ayrshire, it's almost an insect-free zone, not because Ayrshire is um, heavily agricultural, although it is. Um, it's because the coal measures are just incredibly poor soils. Um, and you see that elsewhere on the coal measures. Um, the mm -hmm. same thing holds in the uplands. As soon as you get onto highly met metamorphic systems, they, they are much, much less biodiverse. Um, if you get onto some of the serpentines where you've got a lot more base influences, all of a sudden you have an explosion, radiation of interesting plants, and you see insects that you just wouldn't see anywhere else in that area. And that's that's the geology that's not the the climate so we have to start thinking much much more richly about the the the, the underlying factors behind insect distribution and we just don't see people looking at it that way mm, yes okay so comments from rob uh thanks for reading these out um great answer on re-biodiversity i agree thank you <laughs> <laughs> good a convert Okay, uh, question from John Showers. Is there an effect detected of climate events on saprozilic species? Oh, now that's an interesting one, John. Um, I think, but I can't completely prove that there is something of a radiation of saprozilic species as a result of warmer summers. We're seeing that with things like Calicera. Calicera spinoli is moving quite dramatically. We've seen the same with Calicera aurata. And I would have said that several others, some of the um, Cryorhina, for example, are much more abundant now than 40 years ago in some areas. Now, whether that's a climate change impact or whether that's an ancillary factor that we've seen 20, 30, 40 years of tree planting and those trees are now reaching a level of maturity suitable for saprozilix, I can't answer. I can certainly say in my local patch, when I started recording in the 1980s, uh, cryorhina did not occur there. Um, Today, um, cryorhina are quite widespread, as are Brachiopa, which I didn't see in the 1980s. So they are definitely, uh, they're definitely there, um, and they've definitely come in. Now, whether that's climate change or whether that's the fact that we've got more habitat, I can't answer. Uh, what I would say, though, if you were looking at um, saprozylic conservation, the first thing I'd start to do is to have a moratorium on felling uh, moribund street trees. Um, maybe do something more about making them safe. But oh. the numbers of times you see wonderful pollarded trees, they've been pollarded for 40 years, they've got lots of lovely holes in them, and then they get cut down. 
just as they're becoming ecologically interesting. I think we need a lot more en en emphasis on that. And, and I'm afraid I, I think, you know, this is an engagement with, with ARB officers who understandably are concerned about um, public safety, but have no concept of the impact they're having. So I would for a start ban stump, stump grinders. I think they should all be taken to the tip and blown up. Okay, some comments here. Uh, I think this is from Barbara Ismay. Um, saying there was a very interesting talk at the last Congress from Alex, uh, 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 surname is S-Z-Y-M-A-N-K. Axel um, Simank. That's it. Um, and he revisited uh, a site in Germany and showed an 82% decline, uh, much of this um, hoverflies. Yeah, that's that's the, um, that, that's the that's the Kreppel entomological group's work that was um, uh, published by Caspar Halman and company in 2017. Um, okay. Yeah, um, it's it's quite profound data. Um, the only thing I might say about that is I I'm not convinced that the extrapolations made are necessarily as robust as um, as people are jumping to the conclusion over. After all, th these are one or two malaise traps run at different sites on different years. Mm -hmm. So although there is some something to go on, and there is certainly some very worrying evidence, I think I'd want a much, much bigger data set in terms of the numbers of traps run and the consistency of those traps run in a range of habitats, because I suspect mm. we may actually be seeing different factors in different places. Mm. Mm. Uh, bear in mind yeah. that, that we're talking about potentially picking up aerial plankton rather than um, uh, than very discrete habitat. This may be quite a lot about insect movement. Mm, okay, so interesting comment from Sue Taylor. Uh, talking about her local nature reserve, which she says is um, overrun with pheasants. Um, and I understand the game bird densities are increasing and biomass of pheasants is already greater than the combined biomass of native birds. I wonder if this is an issue in the southern woodlands alongside those already mentioned. Um, I can't really answer that. Um, as, as, uh, there are there are relatively few data sets that we can draw on to make any comment. Um, the one thing I can say is that if we're going to start to make comments, firstly, we need better data sets. Secondly, we mm -hmm. need um, uh, some very, very um, targeted research to try and understand some of the relationships and some of the drivers. Now, that sort of research is just not happening. Um, now, I, I'm hoping that some of the things that BTO and I are talking about may actually end up with starting to drive some research. But at the moment, it's 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 about turning a juggernaut. Um, I, I've, I've been trying to get a, a, a meeting together where uh, we draw together some of the uh, the field specialists with the academics. Um, and whilst the, the group that I'm talking to are very receptive to that, um, I don't get the same feeling of that receptivity from uh, other parts of the academic world. Okay. Right. Um, so you're getting um, applause from Jenny Wilding for your comments on front gardens. Um, <laughs> and somebody else as well. Uh, Rob Davis is applauding you also for your, your front garden comments. Um, and Elaine Wright, um, are we rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic uh, with practical conservation work? Or can any actions make uh, a difference against the overwhelming effects of climate change? Ah, well, the real question is, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Um, uh, my, my middle name is Eeyore. Um, and as such, um, 
I might argue that no, there's not much chance of doing anything and we're just going down the pan. Well, that, that's no good because we've got to present uh, some, positive, uh, some positive thoughts. We've got to try and drive the agenda. Uh, the reality is that, yeah, things might be pretty hairy, um, but unless we give young people something to drive for, they're going to give up and that's no good. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I'm quite prepared to be the last man standing at the battlements firing my machine gun. But the reality is, um, you know, you've got to you've got to mobilize the troops in a way that's constructive. And I think that's where I think we can do something with Diptrus Forum. We can say, where are the things that we can make a difference? Well, the most important thing is we can be much, much more assiduous in our recording. We can try to develop research programs together with some of the uh, the, 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 the leading organizations such as BTO. Um, we really have to start pushing that agenda uh, and start start to show the, the real depth and strength of organizations such as ours. We're the only ones arguably that have any taxonomic knowledge um, and we're the only ones now with a great deal of ecological knowledge of, of invertebrates, not just Diptrus Forum, but, you know, uh, BNHS and so on. It's field naturalists that have got the grip. Mm. Yeah, I think I would agree with all of that, Roger. And I think Elaine, I think, yes, Roger makes an excellent point. We've, we've got to be careful how we frame what we say, we say about climate change, because it, it is, I think to an extent, we, the scientific community, have have got our psychology a bit wrong, and we've left everyone feeling, you know, hopeless and helpless. That the Edward Munch painting, you know, mm. um, and you know that that stops people from doing anything because they feel so hopeless and helpless about it that you just push it to the back of your mind. And I don't want to think about that; it's too depressing. And we need to frame it in a different way and say. Here are some positive actions that you can take. Here are some things that you can do. Yes, it, we may well be moving the deck chair, but if we don't put a more positive frame around it, then people will just carry on not doing anything. I think yeah. that, I think the real the hopeless and help, helpless feeling is having a big sort of drag effect and stopping from people doing the little things. So you know, let's just identify things that will will be constructive and and highlight them and say here are some constructive things you can do off you go do these now this is a good thing to do because the alternative is to do nothing and you know let's not think about that okay we've totally run out of time roger um it's all right. i need to stay away and get myself a drink and we've only got three minutes before it's time for will's talk so i'm going to have to stop there there are yep. some more comments in the chat so i can Pick those out, uh, and if there are specific questions to Roger, I will email them to Roger uh, and get a response from him for you. So um, thanks very much for the engagement. That was a great uh, question and answer session. So I'm going to just do it for a few minutes, um, and so we'll be back. Want to change back to you as presenter. Uh, yes, please. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh, hang on. I'll hang be on. back in a few minutes because it's nearly time for Will's talk. Let's just change. Change presenter. Yes, there we are. Okay, all over to you, Zoe. Oh, she's run away. Right. Hello, Roger. Can you hear me? It's Rob here. Hello, Rob. I can hear you. Yes. Hello. Oh, uh, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for that. Really, uh, really right. good. Thank you. Anything to be and, to cause um, trouble? You know me. I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> I don't think so. It's really really helpful to hear all that stuff and the positive stuff about what we can do as Zoe said so important yeah I think that's essential I I don't think that we should just roll over I think we've actually got to um to start to grab and take a lead and that's and that's something Diptris Forum can do I mean it, it needs a few people it needs young people to take a lead it's no good you and me doing it we're we've got another 10 years we need people like Will to take over um, so I'm sorry, I'm setting the challenge to Will. You know, it's your job to to, to take over from us, um, use the grey beards, and actually push the the agenda. 
<laughs> okay, uh, one thing I would say, Will, is that the, the subtitles don't seem to have been working. And I'm just, I'm wondering why, because we enabled them, didn't we? Oh, look, they're working. Perfect. <laughs> I think. So what can you yes. see? You can see presenter view. There we go. Oh, okay. It says whenever I say inset migration, it says something about nightmare. There you go. It's working now, Will. <laughs> okay, I'm going to mute myself and away you go. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, um, let me just reset the timer so don't run too much badly. But yes, hello and thanks, Roger. Uh, hopefully this will follow on really nicely from yours because there's a bit of um, internet migration decline in here as well. Um, but anyway, yes, my name is Will Hawkes and I'm a um, PhD student um, and inset migration scientist down at the University of Exeter. And I'm oh, really quite close to the end of my PhD now, it's getting a bit scary, funded by um, the Royal Society. And this talk is going to be all about, um, well, it's titled The Migrants of Eden and it's going to be all about my uh, research a couple of years ago in Cyprus, um, all about inset migration. And PhD and um, here's a few stuff to keep in contact with our latest research coming through and yeah hopefully this uh, Cyprus paper will be out um, it's going to be submitted really soon I hope I'm currently flat out working on it but yes thank you very much for listening thank you very much Will I've got a plethora of questions here first one from Stephen Tapman we lived in in Iraq in the late 80s and Saddam was draining the marshes to displace the marsh Arabs. These were reflooded when the regime fell. Do you know if there's any historical data to show the disruption in migration over the period? I I don't know if there's any data at all unfortunately. There may be some with butterflies but I think as Roger was saying earlier the, the lack of data sets is in terms of insects is certainly a problem and we certainly just need to keep looking at it now, so hopefully in the future um, they can be useful. But uh, I, I'm, I'm certain that it would have had um, a big effect, like as Roger was saying, draining, getting rid of the water. Like so many of these insects rely on water to survive. That um, uh, yeah, that would have had a big effect, I'm sure. But I don't have any definitive answers, I'm afraid. I mean, to, to answer Stephen from 2010 onwards there has been some suggestion that um, the grazing on the edges of the marshes and increased in salinity has meant that the uh, the coming back into health hasn't been as quick or as successful as was hoped but it's still a work in progress um, John Showers is there any evidence that light sources draw in migrant insects as they do birds and does this mean that they will be that they will see land much further away or is it oh, yeah. all a diurnal migration? So this was all diurnal migration. Um, so that wouldn't wouldn't have been a effect. But yeah, I'm certain that that would have had uh, would would have an effect for all the nighttime things. Yeah, we really wanted to look at um, the nighttime migrants there in Cyprus, um, but <laughs> we got there and like within the first week, our moth trap was stolen, <laughs> and so we couldn't. But um, yeah, the uh, yeah, it's, I'm sure it has a big effect. But also, that area of Cyprus is almost completely devoid of um, uh, of light sources. It's really wild. But um, in other parts of the world, definitely, I'm sure that has a big effect. Okay. Question here from Linda Pryke. Question, observation, Will and Roger. How much of Britain's diptera are actually incoming rather than homegrown? Oh, I... Wish I don't, I don't have any great um, definite for this, but I'm sure sure a lot of them are. There's you certainly see a big movement in of um, things like Episurphus boreatus, Marmot hoverflies, and Tenax, and there are. Um, and then in the autumn again, we've got a guy on um, the oil rigs in the North Sea, and he sees loads of Upiodes hoverflies coming in in August or so, coming down presumably from Scandinavia. And yeah, I, I don't think insects care at all about borders. And mm -hmm. so they, there's just a big wash of insects tidal. And I think 
not every insect will do these huge, huge movements um, up and down, but then they'll, I think there's a lot of sort of smaller scale migration that happens. There's a few bit of evidence that bumblebees may go across the North Sea. Um, and uh, certainly in Sweden, they they go up and down from the south of Sweden into across the sea into um, just further south. And so I think insects, if it doesn't feel right for them in the area, like environmentally or whatever, then there will be a bit of movement. So I don't know what percentage will be coming into the to the UK, but I'd expect it's a fairly sizable amount. But then there's loads, it's, it's a completely different life history to a lot of other um, flies, which are far more um, niche in their needs. And so they may stay where they are and just hibernate. <laughs> yeah, that's not very good, answer, but you know. <laughs> okay, that's, that's wonderful. Rod, did you have any input there? Uh, yes. Um... I think we have to try to remember that what we're, what Will's been looking at are species that breed up very, very quickly and form very, very large aggregations. So things like uh, Episurfus that will have anything like four or five generations a year, um, Aristatus tenax certainly is probably in the in the Middle East fairly consistently brooded and perhaps doesn't um uh go through a winter uh, rest period as we see in europe um so these migrations are fast breeders and quite generalist um so in terms of what we see in the uk when you get these spikes of numbers they're migrants the the vast majority of british species are almost certainly single single generation, perhaps two generations, and very specialist. So you don't get large numbers of them. They might be in good numbers in that area, but not big, big numbers overall. Mm. What we don't know is the degree to which these things actually move around. But we can say that if you create habitat, things arrive. And what we haven't done as yet is perhaps to look at a completely sterilized area, ideally in an, um, um, uh, in an agricultural desert, allow it to develop up and look at what there is arriving year on year. Now that's been done with dragonflies. Uh, Norman Moore did that many, many years ago. He followed um, his, um, he, he created a wildlife area with a large pond in it. And, and what was very surprising was, even though they weren't in the area, the dragonflies came in in very quick numbers. So there is potential for recolonization. Um, there are things that move around a lot, but not everything moves around a lot. And the things that are probably most under threat are the ones that are the least mobile, highly specialized and least mobile. Now, we can't characterize that yet. We could do some quite good guesswork on it, um, but we mustn't jump, jump to too many conclusions at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question here from Matthew Bulbert, um, more on the uh, technique and methodology. Hi, Will. Fabulous talk. Lots to think about. When you say you counted individuals per frame of video, was there some level of automation? And if so, what did you do? <laughs> I wish there was some level of automation. There is. So, um, that video that I showed wasn't um, quite what we were using. We 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 just filmed a, like basically a rock on the other side of a the a track that these insects are passing through, and so we could see the insects passing this this rock. Um, and we recorded for one minute every fifteen minutes throughout the day, and we so when we got back to the UK and started analysing the data, we um, we took the video file and then slowed it down or separated it out frame by frame and then just counted the numbers going across for that minute. And then we times that number by 15 to get to the next 15 minute count. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of work. We had something like 4 million frames or something to go through. Um, but 
yeah, there are some days of low numbers, but yeah, we we wish that there was some level of automation. We've tried a lot, and we've tried different ways of um, because we do the same work in the mountains, and we've tried re removing the background and then just using software to go across. But we find that in the mountains it was difficult because the wind sometimes made our tripod wobble, and then it would just completely mess up the background, and yeah, we. <laughs> I think we're gonna so after my PhD, hopefully we continue doing um work on this <clears throat> using and we think that these inset uh, migration cameras are gonna be a really important way of, of of assessing how many are going through. And so yeah, if we could get a way of making sure it's really stable and then also getting some software to count them, that would make our lives so much easier. I've just come back from the mountains and I know how much work I've got to do and I get this Cypress paper out with the, the Pyrenees data, um, just counting it all. But yeah, we don't use any automation as yet, but hopefully in the future. One wonders if it's uh, a portent of dystopia, you get ANPR for invertebrates flying across your camera, you can optically DNA them. I mean, what, what place for a field entomologist? Uh, question here from, are we okay on time, Zoe? I, I was just going to jump in. We, we are overrunning. Um, okay. Quite a bit. Is that okay with um, Donald? Because you're the next speaker. Are you okay? Donald's okay. And is, is Rob Davis there? Because he's the final speaker. Um, I'm just wondering if it's okay with you that we're overrunning. Uh, Rob, not <laughs> not sure where Rob is. It's also um, okay. It's also okay with me if we're overrunning. Okay. Oh yes. Sorry. I mean, the questions seem so worthwhile. We could almost tabulate them and get the presenters, well, if they would, to answer them and publish it. We we uh, we do actually get a log of all the questions, so we can if Will is willing, email the, the questions that we haven't dealt with yet to Will. Does yeah. that sound like a plan to try and get back on track? I'm so happy with that, yeah. Yeah? Okay. So I think that's what we're going to do. So how far did we get, Mark? What was the last question that we dealt with? Uh, it was Linda's. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, hold on. It was, no, it wasn't. It was the question on. Where are we? I'll work that out with you if we want to move onwards. Okay. Well, I think we were somewhere around. Um, it was 1217, Matthew Bulbert. Matt, yes, I agree with that. Okay. So I've got a note of that. So everything after that needs to be emailed. Okay. I think that's the plan. So with that, thank you so much, Will. That was a great talk. That was really interesting. I mean, so no, much thank interesting you. Thank you. In there. Um, that's really, yeah, astonishing, actually. <laughs> thank you. OK. Right, so I think our next speaker is Donald. So I'm just going to make you the presenter, Donald. You're going to be showing my slides, though. That's right. Oh, no, good point. I need to be the presenter. Well done. It's good job. Good job. You're on top of things, Donald. Right. OK, I, can you see that, Donald? Is that working? Yep, that's fine. That's great. OK, so, uh, all right. After Will has been taking us to the Mediterranean and uh, blue skies and mountain tops, I want to take you to the world of uh, piles of rotting seaweed on the seashore around the British coast, which is a little bit more mundane, I fear. But um, so I'm to talk about the kelp fly recording scheme, which was started up uh, around this time last year, and uh, it's uh, as the name says, it's uh, about recording a, a, a small number of species that are found in uh, in rotting seaweed on, on the seashore. So could I have the next slide, uh, Zoe, please? Um, so the, the, um, 
there, as I said, there are very few species. There, there's three different families which are, are covered in the scheme. Um, there's um, and uh, that there are headshots of the of the different species there, just to, to give you an idea of what they are. All quite bristly and uh, I think not very beautiful flies in, in, in to my eyes. But anyway, they're they're what live in the in the seaweed. Um, so it's rather unusual. I initially just intended to um, uh, do Coelopidae, which are the, the, the three species in that, but there are two other uh, families, Heterochelidae and Helcomyzidae, of which is one species each in these families, which are also, there's only one species, British species on the UK list in these species, and they're, they're found in, in seaweed. Um, there, are, there are other flies found in seaweed which are, are not covered in the scheme. Um, uh, notably, there's a, there's a sepsid, which looks, um, uh, at first sight, rather like one of these, but that's so that's covered by the septidate recording scheme. And then there's all the things that you're likely to come across, such as uh, uh, the, some dung flies, some some anthemiads, which are have very nice wing waving behaviour and are more found on the shingle um, beside the seaweed rather than on the seaweed. And there are also some tiny little uh, sporocerids again, which are, are are not covered by the scheme. So that's that's the caveat. It's just the big nasty bristly flies that that I'm interested in. Uh, for, for this scheme. And uh, Zoe, can I have the next slide, please? So I could go through each species in detail. I, I don't really want to do that, though. I just want to I'll just give you an example of, of how things look. So the the, the most abundant, the most common um, fly is this Colopa frigida, which is um, has been called the bristly legged seaweed fly by um, Stephen Falk on his on his Flitter um, postings. And uh, I'm just putting here the, the most recent NBN map for the species. You can see it has really a distribution all around the, the coast of, of, uh, of Britain, uh, as far as, as Shetland, but in the Outer Isles. Bit of a gap on the east coast of England, but I think presume that's just a recording gap. And um, what I would like to point, uh, bring your attention to is that the, the seasonality data for it at the, uh, the bar graph at the bottom shows that the, this fly can be found uh, every season of the year. And uh, I, I think I went out on, on uh, New Year's Day last year and uh, found them quite happily on the in piles of seaweed near where my mother lives on the beach so they're, they're there for to be found whenever you want to go out and find them which means that this uh, the bulge in the middle of the uh, of the distribution of the seasonality that's a that's a measure of um, of uh, dipterists rather than um, this fly I think that that shows our recording effort rather than the, the, the presence of these flies. So uh, this species, at least, is breeding all year round in seaweed on the shore. We've got a close-up of the head of this, uh, this species on, on the right. And uh, I, I particularly like it's, uh, the, the, the jaw. It has this, this jutting chin and very bristly face. And so uh, if I could have the next slide, Zoe, I, I wonder if we could uh, give it a new name instead of calling it uh, the bristly seaweed fly. Could you go back one, Zoe? Um, I, I want to call this the Desperate Dan uh, seaweed fly because it uh, has a obvious similarities to the, the well-known um, character. Okay, can you go to the, the next slide, please, Zoe? So why, what's the interest in, in these flies? Well, the, obviously there's a small number of species, five species is a uh, reasonable, uh, a small number to get your handle on. They're, they're all very widely distributed. Um, and apart from one species, they can be found all year. And it's reasonably easy to, to validate um, um, records from photo, um, photos that are sent in. So I, I've been doing that on iRecord, and th these are now coming from iNaturalist um, and uh, some on Facebook as well. Um, I hope that the setting up this um, the recording scheme will, will allow me to collate existing records. And one thing that would be uh, 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 on a research side is to try and um, see if we can support a a claim that has been made that the, one of the, this Coelopa species, Coelopa polypes, has been spreading northwards um, in, in, uh, to the um, north of Scotland, Orkney. Uh, it's not, not made Shetland yet, but anyway, that this has been a recent um, change. So it'd be very interesting to know if we can uh, support this from historical records and from continuing um, um, observations. And just from a personal point of view, we know why, why the kelp fly uh, recording team. So um, I uh, happened to have found several of the species, so it was easy for me to say, right, I, I can recognize these things. And I was quite keen to contribute to the Dipter recording, which is a, a fantastic thing. I just wanted to be part of that. But I also, I, as, a, as a novice to the field, I found the, the recording landscape um, of, of 
for Diptera, or, or, or not just Diptera, but just in general, very confusing. Um, and it gave me an, a chance to understand what this recording landscape is. So Zoe, could I have the, the next slide? Um, what I thought my, I was getting myself into was kind of the bottom bit in the circle, so that I knew that there was this MBN atlas and that um, people would put records into iRecord and that my role would be to verify uh, records and feed them into the atlas. And I now realize, you know, a year on in my wisdom, I realize it's a lot more complicated than that, obviously, as, as you, I'm sure you all know, but just, I just want to run through this because it's, uh, um, I think it's, it's interesting on a, a family with so few species as this. So there, there is, um, uh, on the top left, we've got spreadsheets. So there's individuals with their own personal records, which I'm, I'm keen to get into a, a database and feed into the, the atlas. There's also um, in journals that have published records and different things. I'm particularly thinking of Scottish islands have good um, fly lists that, that um, could be put into the, uh, the, the database. And obviously, uh, the, already the Diptris Forum meeting databases goes directly into NBN Atlas. But then going to the top right, there's, there's a lot of, um, of specimens in museums that, are, that are, um, don't appear in the databases. Um, there is uh, the social media side of things between, um, which is um, a, a large area of um, uh, un, uh, unknown uh, complexity. And then all the, the survey work that goes on, which to some extent is, is maybe already carrying into NBN. So it's not just, uh, I, I just say this as my, uh, it's, it's helped me to understand how these different things feed together into producing what what is what I think is for me is the ultimate thing, which is that you have a, a map on NBN Atlas that anybody can then go and look at and say, all right, that's the distribution, that's the historical data on this particular species. So that's what it would be nice to, to approach. Um, and I realize that it's a big, do a daunting task, even for only five species. Um, so could I just have the last slide, please, Zoe? Um, so, uh, where I'm at is I'm very keen to get additional records, particularly from the, from the north of Scotland and the islands. Uh, and people have specimens in their personal collections. I'd be very happy to add those into the database. Um, and also, people may have um, surveys or know of literature. And I'm starting to get a handle on, on data in museums. Um, Jeff Hancock has, has kindly been through the, the um, Hunterian specimens, and I'm hoping to get into the National Museum, of Scot National Museum of Scotland and look at their specimens very soon. But uh, obviously there's many more museums than that. Um, I feel I should make some kind of resource available for people to identify these kelp flies and put something on the, the Diptris Forum website. So that's, that's something I need to do. Um, and on a, a more uh, investigatory a aspect, there's a very good PhD from the 50s by Eggleshaw on, on kelp flies. But there's a very large literature on, on kelp flies because there's an interest in um, in biology and in, in their, um, their their sexual behavior. Um, quite interested to know how the flies uh, relate to the, the spring and neap tides. I'm sure there must be an interesting um, life history thing going on there, which has not been described. And the last thing I wanted to mention is one of the species, uh, Helcomata astulata, which is the one I've not seen so far. I'm still looking out for it, but it seems there are no records on, on NBN um, from, um, December to April. So it seems to disappear in contrast to the, all the other kelp flies. So that's the question. Does it breed all year? Is it is it uh, genuinely doing something else in the winter? Um, and I'm very keen to hear if anybody's uh, ideas or um, if anybody wants to, uh, can provide records, that'd be fantastic. I put the, the recording scheme website up there. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, uh, look forward to the records flooding in. Thank you very much. That was a very informative uh, presentation on what is quite a small group of flies. Uh, and I do have some records I'll be supplying you. Are there any questions for Donald? I haven't got any in the, uh, the chat box or the question box. Anybody have any? I'm sure we'll get one or two later on that people will suppliers and then we can forward on to you. That'd be great. Thank you. Zoe? I think, uh, Donald, you mentioned um, making some resources available. 
um, uh, a lot of, well, some schemes are using um, scratch pads. Um, so if you're going to hang around, um, the last talk is from Rob Davis, who's the new scratch pad developer at the museum. So um, he should be able to give you information on that. Basically, their websites and you, they're very easy to build and they're designed for biodiversity um, data. So um, it is quite a nice way of um, serving images and um, test keys and things like that. Um, and they are quite straightforward to build. So it, it, it's an option anyway. Right, okay. We've caught, I think, a bit of time back there then. What's the next order on the program, Zoe? Lost sound. I'm sorry, I've, I'm getting no sound. Mm. If you can hear me. Hi, Mark. Can, can you hear me? <clears throat> I can now hear you. Yes, Martin. Yeah, so I, I believe I'm due to take over um, for the, the last two talks this morning. Um, just in case Zoe's listening, I, I can't actually see the questions that are coming in. So if there are any questions, somebody ah. else will have to pick up on those. Um, but I, I believe it is uh, my privilege to introduce Denise Warman to give us the next talk, which focuses on a, another recording scheme. And uh, we're, we're certainly getting a lot of variety in our diptera today, from, from the Mediterranean to the coasts and now into bird and bat nests. So over to Denise to introduce another group of fascinating flies to us. OK, can you see my PowerPoint? We can. OK, and it's in the proper mode and format and everything and looking good. It looks good to me, yep. OK, brilliant. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Denise Warman. Um, I'm the Hippobosidae part of the Hippobosidae and Nipturibididae recording scheme, which we started in November last year. The other half is Erica McAllister, whom you will all know really well. Uh, I have to say, I'm not actually a proper entomologist. I feel, um, you know, I'm not really, you know, as qualified as anyone else here to comment on a lot of things, but I'm working hard at this. I'm really more of an ornithologist, but my background is in medicine. So this was quite a steep learning curve for me, um, but hopefully, you know, I'm getting there. So I'll give a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you an introduction to the Hippobosidae and Nyctrobididae and talk about the species in Britain and Ireland, the history of recording in the UK, um, and the 2021 Mapping the UK's Flat Fly Project, and then follow up, finish with the number of records that we've got so far. So, both groups, the Hippobosidae and the Nyctrobididae, are obligate hematophagous ectoparasites, which basically translate as uh, parasites which are blood sucking clingers on. They're brilliantly adapted for their uh, life style. Um, the flat flies, which I'm afraid I will talk mainly about these because I know more about these than bat flies, are really flat as you'd expect from the common name. They're also known as louse flies across most of the world. They have an ability to scuttle sideways, so this allows them to escape from their host that might try and remove them uh, as it preens. Um, they also, flat, some of the flat flies which can fly, not all species can, are um, capable of really fast silent flight to actually land on a host. Now, both groups are part of a group that used to be formerly known as the Puparia. Uh, it's the same group that Tetsi flies are in. So they have an unusual life cycle, life cycle. The females don't actually lay eggs. They uh, keep fertilized eggs within the uterus. And one at a time, they uh, allow these eggs to feed from what's known as a sort of milk gland. The larvae develop inside the uterus up until the final instar when they're released and they rapidly um, pupate, forming a puparia, or puparium, sorry. Um, so the flat flies are parasites of birds. 
the keds of larger mammals and the bat flies, obviously the Nycterobididae are um, found on, entirely on bats. In the UK, we currently have 12 species and there's been one incidental, accidental import, uh, that's flat flies, three species of keds and an accidental import. And there are three species of bat flies. You can find the list in um, Peter Chandler's list. Uh, your best guide for identification at the moment is um, Tony Hudson's uh, 1984 um, Royal Entomological Society of London guide. Uh, you can download this free of charge from the Royal Entomological Society's website. So an introduction to some of the species. Uh, the bat flies, we've got three species. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to even pronounce this one. Uh, they're only found on bats. So part of this problem of studying most of these flies uh, is that they're only ever seen on their host. Um, these, you can find the puparia in bat roosts, but the flies themselves will almost always be on a bat. And not many people handle bats. So if you want to study them, you need to get in contact with bat workers. Um, this is the one, you know, as I say, I can't pronounce. Um, very strange looking things. Virtually everything in them is vestigial. Um, they're really small. Um, most species are between two and three millimeters. Um, and uh, the other species, um, you know, they get, they're very weird. They tend to rest with the head over the back of, let me just put my pointer on, um, the head folded back across the top of the thorax. So that they look really strange, like there's not really any fly there and the head sort of tends to come down when they feed. These are the ones I know a bit more about, um, the keds. Um, so we have three species of keds in the UK. Uh, probably the most familiar to people will be Lipoptina cervi. Um, this is uh, known, also known as the deer ked. And you may see these in large swarms, probably found throughout the country, anywhere there are the deer. Uh, Hippobosca aquina. Uh, it's also known as the new forest fly or the forest fly. Uh, this one um, seems to have a very local distribution from what I can tell at the moment. There's a population around the new forest, but there's also quite a large population on Dartmoor. Um, I wonder if it might be associated with old, um, wild horses elsewhere, and I have looked on Exmoor but not found it. The sheep cared, um, Melophagus ovinus, is um, probably extinct on the mainland. We're not sure. Um, it would have suffered dreadfully during um, when dipping sheep was compulsory. And, um, but it is still found in some of the Scottish islands where sheep dipping didn't take place regularly. Then coming on to my favorite group, the flat flies, which is the group that I'm actually studying as part of my um, PhD. The, I'm only going to con um, consider the, the most common species that you're likely to see in any detail. We've got Craterina pallida. This is uh, generally found on swifts, although occasionally on other hirundines, so your swallows and house martins. It's quite distinct because it's quite sort of fat bodied, almost conical sort of shape. Um, if you look at this one. And the wings are quite short, they can't fly. Um, they're quite wide at the base and then they sort of tail in the apical region to a point, which is quite short. They, then we have Stenepterus hirundinus, which is also known as Caterina hirundinus. Uh, you'll find it as, listed as that on iRecord and a lot of other um, data websites. The name keeps ch changing backwards and forwards. And I think from having a look at some of the things online, it's probably heading back again. Um, this has a sort of long side shaped wing, which if it were, in its more sort of normal resting position would, would end about here, which actually has quite a narrow base and it's, and it's slightly smaller than Caterina pallid, tends to be slightly lighter colour. Um, and this is found almost entirely on house martins and um, sand martins, um, but and occasionally on swallows and very occasionally it's been recorded on swifts. 
We then have uh, the Ornithomyia. Uh, we've got three common species um, and one infrequently recorded species. Uh, the largest is Ornithomyia avidicularia. Now, with this genus, what you're looking for is you're looking for these three veins here, and then you've got one, two, three cross veins. This one on the discal cell is usually not filled in all of these. If you start seeing similar looking flies, where these two veins here are merged virtually on the costa, for sort of this apical length segment here, I'm going to get very excited and I want to know about them. Also, if you start seeing a similar looking fly with a fourth vein running here, I, I would be very interested. Um, but generally, the, so these, this is the largest one of my avilicularia. They're found across a range of birds. Um, main, the, supposedly the smaller flies on the smaller birds, but it doesn't always hold. So particularly on crow family, um, finches occasionally, um, blackbirds, woodpeckers, those sort of birds tend to have a lot of this one. Um, Fringillina is also found on finches and generally smaller birds. Um, this example I put in here, not because it's a particularly good example, because it's an unusual example. They can vary in colour a lot, so you can't really use the colour very easily for identification. Um, this one is particularly green. Um, this will have a wing length of about, it's the smallest of uh, them. It will have a wing length of 3.5 to 4.5 millimetres, whereas um, Avalicularia is quite a bit bigger. Its wing length is um, up to 7 millimetres. Um, so a range of sizes in them. There's a middle size one, which I haven't got a decent photo of, called Ornithomyia chloropus. So if you want to distinguish them, um, there's a good key in Hudson, but sort of main pointers from it are that you want to be able to see the bristles on the scutellum well, although these aren't necessarily a good thing. And you want to be able to look at the patterns of microtrichia, so little tiny hairs all over the wing, particularly in cell um, 3R and um, 1M. Um, so, and they vary in colour a lot, but Supposedly, Ornithomyia chloropus is supposed to be darker, with darker markings on the undersurface. However, there's a bit of a problem with all this. Um, a recent paper uh, which came out about six, eight weeks ago um, by Valerie Lebescu Bodin and Bradley Sinclair, who are working in Canada, has looked at the coming up with a phylogeny of these and has disagreed with everybody a, a lot of other identifications so it may be that we have other species or some of the species we think we have in the UK is the same as the North American species so there might be some changes in this so um, watch this space at uh, the moment from talking to Val, the best she feels the best way to identify them is uh, looking at the uh, wings um, so again, cell 3R has quite distinct patterns, particularly if you look towards the distal end of the veins here with the size of this gap and whether it's present or absent. So if there isn't one, it's probably chlor uh, a gap in the microtrichia, it's probably all of the myochloropus. Uh, if there is a gap, you've got fringillina or avilicularia, uh, and with a quite big difference in size between these two flies, it should be fairly easy to sort them out. The only complication is we have got the two North American uh, species, Anginuria and the Quartii. Um, it's going to get much harder to actually tell them apart, but we'll wait to get some DNA sequencing on that and decide. They're also a possible vagrant species, Ornithomyia biloba, which we've got four UK records I've discovered so far. Uh, it's usually found on swallow, but there is one uh, odd record from a paddy field warbler. Uh, there's also an, another order for Maya, which might be found in Gibraltar or Crag Martin. If we get that bird as a vagrant uh, in the UK, we might just see it. But again, it's quite distinct in this sort of gap in R3. So recording in the British Isles has been quite um, under-recorded, because um, most are only seen by those handling host species. Um, we've got... Um, Lipitina cervi and Hibosca equina are quite well recorded because they have a tendency to swarm. But I don't think it was helped by those two doyens of um, 
entomology and parasitology, Miriam Rothschild and Teresa Clay, who wrote in their book that they found louse flies particularly repellent insects because they're basically covered with ugly backward facing spines. So I looked at potential sources of historic records. Uh, there's some, some in the scientific literature. There's a lot of grey literature, so bird observatory reports, lo reports, local history, na na local natural history society group reports, uh, approach county dipter recorders, there's local environmental record centres, museum collections, um, a lot of those though aren't fully curated, I record, NBN Atlas, um, GBIF, um, and then I've searched the internet um, for searches of species, and I found Tony Hudson and Harry Beaumont were particularly helpful um, in pointing me uh, in the right direction with things. So where's the oldest record I found? Well, 1752 first reference to Hippoposidae in the British literature. Unfortunately, there's no date, but there's some quite interesting descriptions. Um, so there's a swallow's nest fly it's described of, which is quite clearly Stenepteryx hirundinus, because it's the only species with long, narrow wings. Uh, and then there's there's a round-bodied hippoposid, which I think might be Craterina pallida. There's others I can't quite work out what they are. And what's possibly Hippoboscar equina is com um, confused with ticks and horse flies. So the first useful record I found is almost inevitably from Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne, um, where I've managed to find uh, records um, which I can reliably ID from 1773 um, for Stronepterus here in Dinas and 1774 and 1781 for Craterina pallida. He also discusses that Hippoboscar equina um, is a problem with horses uh, in the area and how local horses get used to them. But if anyone brings a horse into the parish from a from an area further north, they've never come across the flies and go wild when they start get bit, getting bitten by them. So sources of more recent rec records, there are a few uh, studies. There's quite a lot by bird ringers uh, at various bird observatories. Um, there are particularly in this um, point. Uh, then we've got Gibraltar Point in Lincolnshire, um, uh, a no longer extinct, uh, extinct uh, bird observatory in Northumberland. We've got uh, Stokeham Island's bird observatory having um, done some studies. Uh, Rye Mead's Ringing Group got involved at one point. And obviously there's Tony Hudson's uh, studies at uh, Eddington Sewage Farm in Surrey. The Soe Sheep Project on St Kilda records Melanophagus and Vinus. Uh, and Clive Turner um, did some work, uh, published a paper on Hippoboscar Aquinum on Dartmoor, and he's currently resurveying the area and looking. But I've not managed to see any targeted species of Nyctrophididae, although to be honest, I haven't looked quite as hard as I have for the Hippoboscidae, uh, because it's partly Erica's um, area. So the first UK wide attempts at recording um, collations of existing data um, by um, Thompson um, in the mid in the early 50s. Unfortunately, we can't really use his records for most species because he didn't distinguish between Ornithomyia fringillina and Ornithomyia chloropus. Um, but we can get a good idea of distributions from Hill um, 1962 paper for the three species of Ornithomyia. Um, the, he didn't do any work on the other two species, the common species, the Sinetrips hirundinus and the Caterina pallida. Uh, Thompson did that and basically showed that they were all across the UK wherever the swallows and house martins were found. So we can see that the Ornithomyia chloropus is mainly a northern species, the other two are probably more southern. But we don't really know where they are now. So I started something called the uh, Mapping the UK's Hippoposidae project. So I, in 2002, I did a pilot scheme. Uh, then this year, I've done a more targeted approach. I've approached uh, bird observatories, uh, bird ringers uh, for target species in specific areas, uh, bird ringing groups, rescue centres, uh, dipteries groups. I put an article in the British Trust for Ornithology's Life Cycle magazine. Uh, started a new Facebook group called Hippoposidae UK and I've been using Twitter. 
Um, I'm also planning to uh, use the data that comes in from the recording scheme partly for my PhD um, for some of the work I'm doing. Uh, with the collection, I sent all my volunteers um, instructions, uh, the inevitable risk assessment, recording schemes, cons inevitable consent form, um, pots for catching flies, tubes, ethanol, and a stamped addressed envelope at the start of the flat fly season. And people have been sending me flies quite regularly. Uh, my volunteers are across most of the country, but if you're a dipterist living on the sort of northern fringes of Scotland anywhere, uh, and you're able to go out and catch flat flies, I would be delighted to know, uh, because I have a few gaps. And a strange gap that there don't seem to be any bird ringers in um, East Cornwall, uh, for some odd reason. So this is all obviously plotted by Watsonian Vice Counties. Uh, I've also got a couple of wildlife rescues, uh, well, four wildlife rescue centres involved as well. But we've had Brexit issues with um, Northern Ireland, uh, Southern Islands and the Channel Islands. They're trying to get records from them because nobody seems to know what protocol is for posting samples. So if anyone does, I'd be really uh, you, you know, keen to hear. So currently in the scheme, uh, well, when we started, we had 30 records on eye record of Hippobosidae and one Nyctrobididae, and there were five records on eye naturalist. We've now got 188 records on eye naturalist and two of Nyctrobididae. Um, most of the records are um, flat flies and keds, most commonly Lipotinus um, servi. Uh, 17 records come through out of eye naturalist, um, and I've recorded. I've obtained a large number of spreadsheets from the local environmental record offices, uh, though I'm still waiting for some to answer. A lot didn't have any records at all. There's various natural history groups that I've got records from uh, and some museums. Uh, and I've got, managed to data mine about one, well, 1,273 records from published literature, virtually all of which are hippobosidae. And I've got over 1,200 specimens for my mappings project. Um, but I've got about 700 of those still to ID. So the managing this database is going to be a bit tricky because everything seems to be in a different format. So really, that's that's about all I've got to say. Um, any questions, or or more importantly, any advice to someone starting up a new scheme? Thanks very much, Denise. That was a fascinating overview of a, a group that I, I suspect is not terribly well known, even to even to people who are art interests. Uh, and it's amazing to see how how much coordination you're putting into bringing in the information from lots of different places. Um, I don't know whether um, Mark or Zoe are able to tell me whether there's any questions that have come up in the in the chat box. Uh Yes, thanks, Martin. There are a couple of questions. Um, I am going to whiz through them quickly because I'm conscious that we are running a lot over time and poor Rob is waiting in the wings. OK, uh, do you think that uh, Hippobosca equina um, are reduced by insecticide application on horses um, and also the sheep uh, Ked fly was suggested as a bat species about 10 years ago, um, but they couldn't do that because it's uh, a pest. So I think that's just a comment, not a question. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think um, drenching horses and everything has really had an effect as the same as sheep dipping um, and the farm, you know, local farmers, they're continually drenching their animals for worms and things. And I think that's had a major effect on these, these parasite species. Um, and that's why we're not seeing them. But deer keds are continuing because deer aren't actively managed in the same way. Mm, OK. A uh, comment from Sue Taylor. I found one of this group in my hair, exclamation mark. Um, I sent it to the NHM, for the attention of Erica and Ines at the, on the DTOR project. Um, but Sue has got some photos if you'd like to receive those. Um, yeah. Denise, we can sort that out afterwards. Um, Darren Williams, um, question about Ornithomyia behaviour. How strong a flyer are there, Ornithomyia? He's wondering how much of their time they spend flying versus uh, resting on the host. Um, we don't really know. I mean, we know that the puparia will drop off the um, host bird um, because they don't, they don't stick or anything. They're just sort of really round and shiny. 
so they fall off and they probably end up on the ground unlike the other species where they're probably shared into a nest because they're mainly on um, nestlings um, mm. so they've obviously got to fly and find a host but they do seem to be quite strong um, flyers I mean they can really give me the run around when I'm in my bird ringing room and I'm trying to catch them and you end up sort of climbing on the surfaces trying to catch them off the windows and everything before you lose track of which bird they came from so they, they can fly quite fast and quite strongly um, which is you know quite amazing really interesting okay um one from david lewis um have there been efforts to gain records from wildlife veterinary hospitals i think you have you've done that haven't you yes um, I've, I've done that i've got um four um wildlife vets um at, um wildlife hospitals actually collecting them for me and a, and a range of other parasites which turn up at the same time because I tend to just get given anything that anyone finds so any fly that comes off a bird so I may be okay. approaching other people but ID help with those. Right and we've got two thank yous from Charles Dewhurst and Darren Williams uh, and with that I think we are done with the questions and we can move on to Rob. Hello there. Uh, right, um, I have. I just need to be able to share my slides. I think. Um, I sorry, I've given, I've given you presenter privileges, yeah. Rob. Hopefully. Thank you. Right. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, I should introduce you, shouldn't I, Rob? I'm sorry, I haven't done that. Right. I've done. I've got it. Thank <laughs> Rob, you. Rob has very recently joined the staff at the Natural History Museum in London, um, and a part of his role is to look at the scratch scratch pads um, and to to think about how we're going to support them going forward and also future developments is that about right rob yeah that's right thank you very much um uh, thank you thank you yeah uh can you can you see these slides sorry just a minute are you able to see these slides here Sorry, uh, can anyone hear me? Yeah, we can. Yes, we can hear you, Rob. We, we're, we're seeing your main PowerPoint at the moment. Oh, lovely! So, Super. So that's... we're not seeing the present. We're not seeing the full screen. We're seeing the actual PowerPoint. At the moment. Okay, that's not the slideshow, I think, Rob. S sorry, Zoe. But... Are you, I don't think you've started the the slideshow. Uh, right. Let's have a look. Um, I just uh, to try and move this out of the way. And this, uh, right? Um, sorry, uh, this is going to present for me. Come on, then. Can you see that? That's yep, it. That's, good. that's lovely. Um, right. Thank you. For, oh, so just uh, go back to the beginning. Um, I hope you can't see that uh, webinar. I'll move that out of the way. That's better. Right. Sorry about that. Right. Yes. Um, thank you for the intro, Zoe. And it's 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 been great to to listen to um, all the presentations this morning. And so so with the Scratchpad software, you know, I'm I'm certainly interested in all of what you're saying as to how I can help um, in terms of the software that I'm involved with making here at the Natural History Museum. So there you, there you can see on uh, the first slide there, uh, and you can see that all right. Is that just to check again? Sorry. You, yeah, can, you can see the, the first slide, okay? Is that all right? Sorry. Yeah, it looks, it looks good to me, Rob. Yeah, okay, lovely. That's it. Thank you. Sorry, beg pardon. Yes, yeah, so those are my contact details on the on the first slide there um, at the Natural History Museum. And so, yeah, I'm going to cover an outline, an overview of, of, of scratch pads and um, about me and uh, what a scratch pad is and uh, where, where we'd like to go in the future in, in terms of moving the platform forward. So I've only been at the museum for a couple of months. I joined in on the 20th of September as a research software engineer uh, within the Biodiversity Informatics Group. And I work with Vince Smith and Ben Scott, uh, among other people. And yeah, I joined um, I was hired to look after scratch pads. I mean, there'd be other things I'm involved with, like the barcode of life as well, which I know was mentioned in the uh, earlier presentation this morning, but uh, certainly a big part of my role is scratch pads uh, as it is now and working on its future. Um, it's based on a technology called Drupal, 
um, which is open source software, meaning that it's free. You can actually see how the software works. Everything's up there on this place called GitHub, where you can see all the code. So you can download the software and, and throw up a Scratchpad site yourself, or you can get the museum to host it. And I'm really enthusiastic about community um, in terms of software communities as well. Um, and I've been involved in things with like Drupal platform, the technology platform uh, to help other people learn it, for me to learn things about it, to collaborate and things like that. Um, so these are the couple of links of, of me online there uh, on that About Me page where I am on Drupal and the Stack Exchange site is like a, a techie site, um, gives you a lot of places where I, I ask questions and answers on the Stack Exchange site. Um, some of it's related to, to the stuff that we're doing technically with scratch pads. So what is a scratch pad? This is something for me that I'm learning as well. So this is a, um, coming here today is, is great for me as part of my learning. So I'm, I'm learning it and I'm finding that it's, it's lots of things to lots of different people. And, you know, I'll, I'll show a few examples of that, including what the tourists are using uh, that I'm aware of. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, as I understand it, it's a virtual, virtual research and publishing platform, um, which, um, you know, we have an account on, you, you have a Scratchpad site and you can collaborate well with other people on, on that site. Uh, and as I said, it's open source. So, you know, it's not proprietary. It's not, it's not, it's not got a license or any lock-in and the content is there displayed on the site and, um, there are ways that you can edit that content. It's your content, it's your site. Drupal itself is, is, um, is very modular and flexible, um, and it's, a, it's quite a good candidate for this kind of um, area that, that, that it serves. And you know, the key thing about Scratchpads is the taxonomic uh, element of it, which I've seen in, in previous um, presentations this morning. And it's, it's quite old software, but Drupal itself has moved further along than where Scratchpads is. Um, but it's a testament really to how good the software has been, that, it's, that it was so long ago in 2007 that it's, it was started. And now here we are, 14 years, can you believe it, that, we're, that, we've, that this has is, this is carried on. Um, so yeah, here's a quote here, uh, linking together evolutionary data by developing analytical tools and proper documentation, and then using that as a framework to conduct comparative analysis studies of the evolutionary process and diversity analysis. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, a major community goal of, of, of scratch pads. So these are the key areas. You've got four areas here um, that that are variations of using the taxa, conservation projects, regions, and societies. So each th these scratch pads will cover one or more of these four main areas in, in their um, logging and, and tracking of tax taxonomy. So what's been looked at is, is similar platforms. Um, as you can see, there are six there. Um, and you know what we don't want to do is reinvent the wheel. There's a there's a term called proudly uh, proudly invented elsewhere, or found elsewhere. Um, you know they they act, they they provide similar kind of things, access to data, um, and various management processes for that data as well. Um, <clears throat> but we found that a lot of these are very hard to maintain. I suppose that could be said of scratch pads in terms of the technology it is now, but but. What that tells us is that other other technologies have got challenges as well. So there's not necessarily a motivation to, to move to one to something else um, if if, there's, if there are similar challenges. And they also lack flexibility and modularity. And scratch pads is made up of lots of Lego bricks um, modules, they call them. Um, and you know we've, we found that they're they're not finished and there's um, a lacking in terms of, although there's an overlap with what scratch pads does, um, the the overlap is not great enough to, for us to say, well, we could um, we could go and use those. And there's also the challenge of migrating the data. So there's a lot of data in scratch pads, and it's certainly possible because it's an open system. But it's it's the thinking of that as well, and 
what well, if your system you're going to is is not complete and you're migrating data how does that data end up do you lose some of the structure um, some need to be hosted by yourself or you can do that with scratch pads so you're going to um, but you can also have us host it as we do on my on the sites um, that, that end in myspecies.info but if you do host it yourself you, you you've got to have the the, the know-how to do it it can be done I mean certainly with scratch pads you can do it but you can also use the services of the museum and some aren't open source and you know I'm, I'm a big fan of open source and that basically means that the software out there is is available for everyone to look inside and see how it works and collaborate on it and contribute and I think it's got lots of benefits in lots of ways and a lot of uh, stuff out there in the world is um, based on open source and it's you know it's um, you can develop a business model around it you can develop a plan around it it doesn't mean it's not so secure because actually having the ability for everyone to collaborate actually can make it better software if, if you if you're closed software you're limiting the the, the scope and the um, opportunity that people can collaborate which i'll come on to a little bit later about how people can help so uh there's a caveat here with this this uh slide it says how many people are using it it was the last survey that we did majorly was in 2018 before my time gives you a bit of um, information about about how uh and, and how much scratch pads is being used and how much data uh, and and, that, and certainly I think we still have that uh, around about that figure of, of um, sites of about 743 scratch pad sites individual scratch pad sites um, I, I, from, from what I've looked at recently for example so there's still a lot of usage um, going on even though that that's that data is a little bit uh, older a few years ago um, and this again this is this is sort of from the same data set and showing a lot of people all around the world using it um, I myself have met um, someone called Carlos who was who's based in Finland. Uh, he, he's using scratch pads, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to hopefully get to know a lot more people. Um, but that's that's a, a snapshot of, of where it has been used, and probably, you know, there may well be still people around the world in some of those places that are still using it. Um, but we'd need to confirm that with a, a new survey, which I'm sure I will discover as we go along. Um, and this this sums up the the kind of um, data that we that we have um, scratch pads being used for. Uh, I mean, some of this I'll say is a newcomer. I, it's stuff that I'm still learning about and what it actually means. Um, but from yourselves, from your perspective, you may understand a bit more um, um, about it, and certainly um, feel free to ask questions about it. So this is a bit of a small diagram probably looks like um, in terms of um, the largest scratch pad sites, a little bit hard to see on my side, but it just gives you an idea of, of that there are varying sizes of, of uh, scratch pad sites. Um, and so these are some of the uh, of those, the top most ones um, that are the largest. Uh, so we've got about uh, eight there, um, top eight of, of uh, people using scratch pads for all sorts of things. Uh, so, you know, it can hold photographs. You can see it's got, there's one with acoustic data, so it can hold multimedia recordings, you know, uh, audio recordings, for example, of, of various organisms. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's can hold different sorts of media. And this is close to home. Um, you may know others, but here's a couple of examples of diptera scratch pad examples here um, showing you uh, the general kind of things that you can do with galleries and, and taxonomy um, yeah if you know others please let us know I'd like to know um, I've, I've done some research uh, with my colleagues to find out you know how you're using them um, so moving on where are we going next with scratch pads um, so we've already put the sites behind a firewall I mean security you know, it's one of those things that you know um, you don't want to to, to have to worry about uh, as users, and and shouldn't need to know about. So you know, when it's when it's working really well, you don't know it's it's going on, um, and so that's been going on. Um, and my colleague Ben Scott has done a lot of work on that. So there's a a list of uh, issues uh, on the GitHub, which is a website uh, where the code is open source. And there's a, a list of issues. 
So let's get, so for me, that's the idea is to get that down to resolve issues. If there are really old issues, see if they're still a problem. If they're not, they've been fixed or, or somehow we've, they've been overcome. I can update the tickets and I'm, I'm also got some issues that I've fixed recently that I've got lined up to release. Um, and better communication with the community. So by me coming here today, uh, I hope is, um, is helping with that. To, to engage with people who are using it. Um, and then we've got an overall uh, uh, overarching scratchpad.org site as a, as a gateway um, to actually make that, improve upon that and uh, update that as well. And this is just a few couple of things that we've been doing in terms of uh, technical side of, of scratchpads that may, may or may not mean a lot to yourselves. Um, but it's just stuff that we're always looking to embrace new technology and these are a couple of technology systems that, that help um, with maintainability and overall us to be able to provide a better service. So longer term, this is, this is um, what really excites me as well, is, is thinking about where we'd like to go in the future. Um, and I think what's important with that is that we take you with us, you know, and that we that you're happy with where we're going. Um, I certainly want to keep the functionality um, that you that you that you enjoy using, um, but also make it possible for us to roll out fixes, your ideas, improvements quicker. Um, and so a lot of things going on under the under the bonnet, um, and looking at different ways in which we can do things, and also innovating with new ideas, like I was saying, uh, new ideas like micro publication, data aggregation. And then, you know, all of that can, can strengthen a case for the funding of it, the, the, the money that comes in to actually um, fund me and, and, and anyone else who works in the museum um, to keep it going, that actually it stays relevant and there's some novel things that, that we're doing. So just to sort of give you a flavour of some things, there's a couple of technical diagrams here. The way I see scratch pads from what I've seen is you've got lots of individual sites and you've got users of them. And then this is a, this is a, a diagram that builds upon that. <laughs> it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's quite a bit different there. And the, and the, and the, um, the things that are in sort of like a, a yellowy color, uh, a, a deep yellow goldy color, if you like, are the new things. Um, and basically what this diagram is saying is that I don't worry too much about the details here, but is that we want to keep all of the scratch pads as they are, but provide new ways in which you can access them, um, which also helps us um, work out ways to, to actually keep the same experience that you get and, and does what it does now. But under the bonnet, things are different in terms of, and that helps us um, embrace new ways of doing things. Because as, as I've said in the earlier slides, it's 2007 is when, when this started. And in terms of software and technology, things have changed quite a lot with the version of software that we have scratch pads on. It's called Drupal 7. Uh, we're now on nearly on Drupal 10 and a lot of lots of change since then. But we're also looking at other platforms. We're looking at Living Atlas, National Biodiversity Network, those platforms as well as 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 ways to actually achieve what what we want to do in terms of scratch pads. But what's important to us is, as we have learned from the other platforms that I mentioned, um, in a few slides back, those six other platforms, we found they were lacking in terms of functionality. So it's very important that we keep what, what scratch, pads, scratch Pads has got now, and, and, um, but, but uh, try and move forward. So there's a lot of challenges there. So those key goals, like I say, work like it does now, different under the bonnet, but still works like it does now. Uh, being different under the bonnet means that we can do things that are more secure and reliable. We've had some issues recently uh, in the last few weeks um, with, with scratch pads. And so what we want to do is embrace new tech to help us, uh, you know, keep those to a minimum. But also as well is do new and innovative things, um, linked open data, micro publishing. Some of these things I don't know quite yet what they are, but I can see with linked open data, um, being able to link different data sets, maybe foster more collaboration between individual scratch pad sites. So that's, the, that's a sort of a, a flavor of the future. So as I said at the beginning, is, is, um, with open source being an open source platform, these are the places you can get help 
um, you can email me, you can raise an issue on the GitHub issue list at that address. And um, with Zoe's suggestion of Padlets, I've created a Padlet as well, if you'd like to collaborate on there. And um, uh, the, if, if the slides are made available, you, you've got my contact, rob.davis at nhm.ac.uk as well. Those are the places you can get help from. And certainly I, I want to be very responsive and be able to help you on those uh, via those platforms. Um, communication channels. Um, so the next thing is how, so there's one, so to say that where you can get help is how, how can you help? Um, so yeah, help us build a case for further funding. So um, send us examples of how scratch pads have helped your community and that could then demonstrate to other people how um, that they, they could use it and that could contribute to um, building a case for further funding. Um, by all means, of being open source, uh, donate technical experience to fix bugs and guide other users. Feel free to go on GitHub and do that. I'm here to, to, to certainly do a lot of that as well. Um, and, you know, opportunities to support maintenance and development of the Scratchpad system, you know, um, going back to the funding case as well. Um, but yeah, report and document bugs, which really is, is basically going on, uh, on the GitHub and, and reporting things. Or, but also via these communication uh, channels as well on the GitHub there, but also via the email address there as well. Um, thank you for your time. So uh, really uh, over to you with, with your questions. Thanks very much, Rob, that was great. Um, I, I think we might be having um, problems with the, um, the questions thingy because we mark couldn't see any questions for donald on the kelp flies but in fact there are a number of questions that have come in for donald um so i will ensure that those we we share those with donald over the email so that we do get an answer so i suspect that i'm going to say there are no questions rob and then later on <laughs> lots of questions will appear so it might be a case of uh me having to, to have a bit of uh, email correspondence with you. But I'm, I'm very pleased to see that you have um, created um, a, um, a scratch a padlet, sorry, not a scratch pad, a padlet um, that um, people can use to, to post comments on. So that's great. I haven't um, included your um, padlet in the, the link that I've sent out. So I, I will do that. The padlets are not going to disappear. Um, I do want to thank everybody who's, who's created one. That's, I really appreciate that. They're great. There's some really nice ones. Um, and I will include Rob's in that. Um, and I don't, can you see my um, teams? Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm not sure why that's there. Um, yeah, so Thank you very much for that, for that, Rob. I really appreciate it, and I'm I'm really pleased that that you've joined us at the museum, and that we're 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 going to have uh, more support um, for the Padlets. But I know that it is all a question of funding and resources, um, and so we need to to sort of restrain our our excitement and expectations because there is only one of you, and you've got other components to your job. It's not just the scratch pads. But um, it's really nice to have you on the team, and um, and I, I will try and get some. Um, yeah, oh, so there, there's a thank you from um, Barry Warrington, just saying thank you to Rob, Ben, and Vince for all their help with his agromizing scratch pad. Thank you very much. So um, I think there is going to be some feedback for you, Rob, um, but I, I can't see it at the moment uh, in the chat. But um, I really appreciate that. And I'm, you know, hopefully the scratch pads will go from strength to strength and more and more people will start using them because from my experience of them is that they're a really useful tool. Um, and I've, I've built a number. I'm not sure how useful all of them are, but <laughs> hopefully um, but the later ones are better than the early ones. <laughs> it's all I will say. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. Thank um, you. Right. Now, that is all the speakers for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions, if you posted any. Apologies if we haven't dealt with your question. We will 
um, we do get a log of all the questions and we will be dealing with them uh, properly this year. Um, we got a bit lost last year and I'm not, I don't think all of the questions that were posed uh, received an answer last year, but we will try and um, do uh, a question and answer clean up after today's session. So thank you very much for participating. Thank you for the Padlets. Um, I think Rob Walton um, wanted to say something. So I'm just going to make Rob the presenter. Um, okay. Thanks. Over to you, Rob, yes? I don't need to be. Yeah, yeah, I don't need to be presented. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yes, I just, as chairman, I'm just going to say um, a huge thanks to all our uh, speakers today. Uh, really excellent contributions. Thank you. But it is customary for the chairman to make a say a few words at what is effectively, you know, part of our AGM process. So if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to ask you to listen to me for just literally just a, a handful of minutes um, to make some closing remarks on behalf of the society. Uh, it's not necessary for me to give you a full report on everything that committee have been doing because it's all written up in the bulletin. All I would like to just say is though that if you have any concerns about the AGM process, in particular about our accounts or about the election or re-election of officers, please do let us know, as outlined in the North Bulletin, before the new year. Before going on, I would just like to congratulate Roger Morris and Stuart Ball for winning the Marsh Award for Invertebrate Conservation this year. It is a prestigious award and it recognises their work establishing and running the Hoverfly Recording Scheme, as well as the multitude of other work they've done to promote the study of diptera. I'm sure you'll agree with me that that is richly reserved, deserved and well done indeed, Roger and Stuart. Now, I've been chair now for five years and I'm just coming to the end of the stint. Um, I think five years is probably a record for anybody to do it in, in consecutive term anyhow. But I'm, so I'm now stepping down and I'm absolutely delighted that Erica McAllister has agreed to take over the role and one that I'm sure she will fill superbly. For me, I have to say it's been a real privilege to be chair for the last five years. During that five years, and this is little to do with me, but a lot to do with other people, but the society has gained in influence and reach. Uh, membership has increased by a third. We now have you know, close to 500 members. Social media, as you would expect, has increased vastly. Our new website, has been a real success and I don't have any measures for this but I'm confident that our two excellent publications the bulletin and the digest have continued to gain readership and impact and on top of all that we the number of affiliated recording schemes we have has increased from 19 to a staggering 28 so that's marvelous isn't it um, just bear with me just a moment. My notes have just disappeared. They come back again. Uh, this has all been achieved as a result of the dedicated work of committee members, past and present, especially officers, but support, supported by a large, um, quite a large number of other members of the society. I'm not going to attempt to name all those involved. But we'll just say a huge thanks for all the support and help you've given me, as well as for the efficient running and growth of the society. I would, though, just like to take this opportunity to mention two people who have helped me huge. They are our former secretary, Amanda Morgan, who continued to work enthusiastically and efficiently for us through her terminal illness. And the other person is our current secretary, Jane Hewitt. There's no way I could have managed without the encouragement and support of either. So thank you very much. 
Um, just as kind of coming to the end, Hal, I'd also like to thank Stuart Ball, who is stepping down from committee after many years of good service. I believe, Stuart, that you have done two stints as chairman, um, amongst many other things. And I'd love, also like to take this occasion to welcome John Mousley onto committee. So I'll just conclude now by saying on behalf of us all, Zoe, a huge thanks to you, thanks to you for organising today's meeting and making it such a success. Thank you. Thanks everyone. And um, yeah, and thank you to the members who um, who took part and, and did Padlets. Um, they're not going anywhere. Um, we will discuss them at the next committee meeting and decide what we're going to do with them. Um, so um, they may have another life, um, I'm not sure. And obviously we'll, we'll speak to you before we, we do anything formal with them, um, like putting them in the digest or something like that. Um, but thanks very much for taking part. I hope people enjoyed them. Um, and I hope people have enjoyed today's session. Thanks very much. So I think that is all for today. Unless anyone has anything they want to say. Okay, so with that, I'm going to draw things to a close. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and um, yeah, I look forward to having a proper in-person meeting next year with everyone. Um, and we will be having the spring identification workshop on crane flies in February next year. So um, I will see some of you quite soon. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be really good. Um, and it would be so nice to get back to get back to, to meeting each other in person. So thank you all and goodbye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. A pleasure. Bye.